Colleagues, we need every single person who's here for quorum uh, to be here physically. Yeah, no, they need to be here physically. I was taking my. I was taking my chair. All right, we'll wait one more minute, please. All right, we now have quorum, so we will start with uh, agenda item 3.0, our equit equitable access to literacy school board work session. And um, I want to tell my colleagues there is no action uh, for us tonight. Uh, it's um, an update on what our focus is, it, what we are doing, what we will be doing, and um, we will have additional work sessions on this throughout the year. So I will now turn this over to Dr. Presidio and his team, and if you could introduce everyone here tonight, and uh, then we will follow our regular procedure as school board members. Once the, once the uh, presentation is finished, we will have three minutes followed by two minutes of questions by board members. So Dr. Presidio, thank you and your team for being here tonight, and if you would please introduce everyone. Absolutely, and thank you, Ms. Dernat Koufax, and good evening, everybody. We're excited to be here and uh, present the work that we're doing around literacy improvements in the division. And um, as you know, we are talking about our work is in terms of building out an equitable access to literacy plan because we feel very strongly, of course, that you know students' academic success and as well as their future uh, economic opportunity is so heavily reliant upon their ability to develop uh, literacy skills and success in uh, reading and writing. So, uh, as Ms. Darinak Kofax said, this, this is not, um, there's no board action um, tonight. This is just an information only uh, presentation and we're really excited to be able to share the work that we're doing. It is not finished. There is not a plan um, as we're referring to the equitable access to literacy plan. There is not a formal plan that has been fully developed and published yet. Uh, we are still in the process of developing that plan, but we have done a lot of work. Um, and we're excited to share the work that we have done and the work that we will be doing as we build that plan out. Um, additionally, uh, just for folks um, to note, this is, this is not an accountability report. You know, oftentimes we present a lot of data to the board, SOL reports, um, even the, you know, upcoming ESSER reports that we're going to have, student achievement goal reports that have a lot of data. We have provided data here, but we've only provided enough data to really provide the context to really help everybody understand the need for us to do the work that we're talking about doing in terms of uh, improvements to our literacy program. So we do have a lot of folks here with us to help with the presentation this evening, and I'm excited to introduce them, uh, starting on my right with Dr. Diane Leipzig, who is uh, a principal at Canterbury Woods Elementary School. 
Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very excited to have her here. Uh, we also have Dr. Donna McConnell, who, and I think this is the first time for many of our board members to, to meet Dr. McConnell, but she's our new elementary school language arts coordinator who joined us just a few weeks ago and has been doing a, a tremendous job leading this work um, in the division. And we also are very excited to be able to welcome Dr. Emily Solari from the University of Virginia here with us tonight. Um, she's been kind of uh, advising us in an informal capacity for a number of months now, so we're happy that she was able to make the time to be here tonight. And I, and I do want to note that uh, she does need to commute back uh, to Charlottesville because she's teaching a class in the morning, so we might need to, we might need to let her get out a little early tonight, uh, but we're excited to have her here. And then, of course, Noel Clemenko, our assistant superintendent from Instructional Services. And we have a lot of other folks that are supporting this work in the audience. And, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but one person I do want to uh, just note in particular is Carrie Liesma, who's in the back, um, and is our dyslexia specialist. Yes, give her a round of applause. <laughs> Carrie has really been doing so much work in this area and really initiated the work around our Equitable Access to Literacy Plan. So I wanted to recognize her. And it is also National uh, Dyslexia Awareness Month, so it's very appropriate that I think we have this presentation at this time. All right, so that's enough for me. I'm going to turn it over to Noelle so we can uh, jump in here because we do have quite a bit of content to share. Thank you, Dr. Presidio, and I, too, am very excited to be here with you all tonight and to bring you this work uh, in progress at the very beginning stages, and we really have a lot, a lot to share with you, um, so we're going to dig right in. Let me give you a sense of what we're going to do tonight. In just a moment, I will turn, um, I will turn the, the presentation over to Dr. Solari, and she's going to be providing you with some remarks to really ground us in the science um, of reading and in some information to really build some context for the change we're making in Fairfax. We will then we'll trans back, uh, transition back to looking at Fairfax County and where we are currently with some reading data, just a, just a glimpse, as Dr. Presidio mentioned. We're going to spend some time looking at some immediate changes and then also spend some time thinking about the future. Um, and we'll wrap up with some next steps. So that is our plan for tonight. And I'm going to turn, um, turn the presentation over to Dr. Solari. And, Having been able to work with her over these few months, what I know about her is she's very, very humble. So um, nobody make eye contact with her while I read this uh, because, um, as most of you know, it's really embarrassing when people are reading your credentials. But, but as I told her, I think it's really important. I think it's important for us all to really understand um, what she is bringing to, to the table this evening. So um, Emily Solari is the Edmund H. Henderson Professor of the Reading Education at the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. She directs UVA Reading and the Phonological Awareness Literacy Screener PALS Office, coordinates the reading education program at UVA. Dr. Solari's research focuses on improving practice in classrooms around both assessment and instruction. Her work attempts to better understand reading development in subgroups of learners who are at risk for reading difficulties and those identified with reading disabilities with the goal of developing and implementing evidence-based language and reading instruction interventions in authentic classroom settings. Her scholarship includes experimental studies, professional development studies, and evaluations of reading interventions and programs in school settings. Her work has been particularly focused on translating the science of reading by engaging with practitioners and policymakers to leverage scientific evidence to improve practice. Dr. Solari's research has been funded by the Institute of Education Sciences, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as various state agencies. She currently serves as the editor-in-chief of the Reading uh, League Journal and as an associate editor for two journals, the Journal of Learning Disabilities and Re Remedial and Special Education. So it is with great pleasure um, that I, first of all, thank you for taking all my phone calls and being generous with your time to meet with us and provide your guidance. And i um, really happy that you're here. And I will turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really very happy. Anyone who knows me or has heard me talk knows that I can and will talk about reading for hours, but I will not do that tonight. I'm going to try and get through this pretty briefly and give you a really broad overview of where we are sort of in the current literature base and the evidence base around what is the science of reading and how can we use that knowledge to implement both assessment and instructional practices and prevent reading difficulties in our, for our youngest learners. So I think we all know this, that literacy is really very important for lifelong outcomes. It has a strong impact on overall academic achievement. It has an impact on economic well-being long-term over the term of an individual's life. It has an impact on social participation, 
um, civil, civil engagement and health outcomes, in particular mental health outcomes for individuals as they develop. Um, we probably also know, or at least I really, really know deeply, that reading is controversial. Reading literacy is controversial, particularly right now. Many people in the education world have heard of the term reading wars, <laughs> as well as a lot of different sort of terms that we use when we're talking about reading. And I mention this because these conversations can be very difficult, but the way that you sort of move forward and make changes by having difficult conversations. I joke, and it's not actually a joke, that 50% of my life is having difficult conversations right now around best practice and reading assessment and intervention. But I think we have to engage in those conversations in order to serve the kids that we are here to serve. Um, so we know that um, early reading difficulties is predictive of later re reading difficulties. And that, of course, makes sense. But when you think about how school is set up in the system, sort of the school system, we would hope that if we were to identify kids who have reading difficulties in first grade, for example, that we would be able to successfully remedi remediate those difficulties by the time they get to third and fourth grade. But the longitudinal data really show that that's not the case. That's not what's happening across the nation's schools that first graders who have reading difficulties are 88% more likely to still have reading difficulties in fourth grade. And third graders who are not reading at proficient levels are four times as likely to leave high school without a diploma. So this early reading instruction screening for kids who are at risk, instruction and remediation is really very important. We also know that proficient, profi proficiency in reading in early grades is also really important for social emotional development, stuff like self-regulation, um, engagement in schools and behavior. So reading impacts social emotional development as well. So really quickly, I'm gonna show you some data. I won't bore you with too much data. We know that um, this is data from before the pandemic. I wanna be very clear about this, that in the general population, about 40% of kids struggle to learn how to read or are not re meeting benchmark grade level goals. And that's the general population. When we pull out kids who are historically marginalized, so kids who are um, kids of color, children of color, kids who are English learners, kids who have disabilities, it's more, it's closer to 60 to 70% of those kids are not reading benchmark on grade level reading assessments. And so I think it's really, really important to look at the data, both what's happening for general population, but also how is this differentially impacting kids who have been historically and are currently marginalized in schools. Okay, so a little bit more. This is publicly available data that I have pulled out. This, these are the NAEP, National Reading Scores for Virginia, that I pulled out from a public data set. And the blue line across the middle here is the average NAEP score for a student in Virginia. The um, orange line that has already shown up are white children, their scores on NAEP scores. And this is a fourth grade assessment of reading achievement, essentially. So where are kids in fourth grade with reading? Um, the gray line are black children. So you can see that they're, they are scoring significantly poorer than the white children and below average. Um, the yellow group is his, are Hispanic children, and so again, significantly lower. Um, the, the blue line that has shown up are kids who, um, qual sorry, who qualify for free and reduced lunch. And the, or, and the green are the ones who are, do not, who are not. So that's the economic variable here, but I think, uh, sorry, green are the kids who do not qualify for free, free and reduced lunch. Yeah, and so um, I think what's really important to point out here is that we often think reading difficulties, um, that the differences between kids is about poverty. And it is, this is true, but in Virginia, and this is not the trend across every state, because I have pulled this out, this is what I do, I geek out on, on data. Um, we also have significant differences based on race. And so I think that's really, really important to point out. We also know the pandemic has not been great for reading and, and other academic achievement and social emotional development. Um, these are sort of data across the general, general population. It's estimated that across the country on average, kids return to school in the fall of 2021, about four months behind on reading essentially, and that's uh, true across all grade levels. But we also know that this is differentially impacting students of color, those who are English learners and those who are, um, have disabilities. 
I'm very aware that Fairfax is not using PALS, but I have access to PALS data, so I'm showing you PALS data from across the state of Virginia because this shows K to two data from the fall, and basically what we're comparing here are the lighter blue color is the spring of 2019, so before the pandemic hit, and the darker blue is the fall, uh, sorry, spring of 2021, so this past spring. And basically we're seeing a two-fold increase of kids who are below benchmark across K to two, and when you look at it broken up by different risk categories, um, the story is even worse. So students with disabilities, students who um, are English learners are performing significantly worse and have been differentially impacted by the pandemic. So I tell you this only because I think it's really, this is really, really important to know that we weren't like hitting it out of the park on reading achievement before the pandemic and now it's even more urgent than it was before. Um, and so what when I think about education equity, um, I think about what, what we need to do to ensure that every single child is achieving um, to their full social, uh, academic, and social potential. And so when I think about that in the context of reading, I think we need to talk about how do you reduce the predictability of who has reading difficulties? So how do we, how do we reduce that predictability? We kind of know um, on average who's gonna have reading difficulties. And then how do we, and at the same time, how do we reduce score differentials on reading assessments between groups of children? So there are some really common misconceptions in the early reading world that I do not have time to go into. This is typically an hour long talk that I give. Um, so I will not go into all of them, but I do want to point them out. So some common misconceptions and misunderstandings about early reading development. One of them is that every child learns how to read differently. The brain science really tells us that this is just not the case. Um, we know how reading develops. We know how the brain learns how to read. I'll talk about that a little bit. We also know that students don't outgrow reading difficulties. Once they've been identified with a reading difficulty, um, they are very likely to continue to have reading difficulty. Another misconception is that we think that instruction for students who have reading difficulties is fundamentally different than those who don't, that it should be different. And I, would, I will talk a little bit about how it's not really that, it's more about dosage, making sure kids have enough effective instruction. Um, we also cannot perfectly predict who is gonna have reading difficulties. And so this is both not great, but also really important from an instructional lens. Because if you consider that you, we can, we can predict, but not with 100% certainty who's gonna have reading difficulties, what that means is that your core instruction then has to be evidence-based. Because if you screen a kid and they don't score as at risk, the only instruction they're getting is in their core classroom. And so that, instruction has to be evidence-based. And that there's a silver bullet. I, I think there is no silver bullet here. Multiple levers have to be pushed on simultaneously in order to change reading achievement. So what is the science of reading? I get asked this all the time. Um, this has become a buzzword. Basically, the science of reading is converging evidence from multiple fields of study this, um, that has uh, come together over decades, for many, many decades we've known, um, that there is a scientific evidence base that tells us how kids learn how to read. Um, it explains how reading develops both neurologically and behaviorally, and why some kids struggle to learn how to read and write. And that's really, really important if you're thinking about instruction. And it should be used to inform evidence-based early reading assessment and instruction to prevent reading difficulties. I'm not gonna spend a whole ton of time here, this is just to show that over the last 20 to 30 years, brain science has advanced because we have the technology, right? So we know different parts of the brain that um, are important for reading development, and we know that in some, for some kids, if, for example, kids with dyslexia, they, um, their brains are set up a bit differently and they don't have activations in certain parts of the brain that, they, that um, typically developing readers would have. Um, and so they're having a hard time making connections um, between sounds and letters on page and other sort of difficulties when they're reading. So, I, but I do want to point out that children learn how to read, not brains. I think this is really important. Children learn how to read, not brains. And so we have to consider the context that children are in. And some of these different factors, these various factors influence reading development. And some of them we have control over as educators and some of them we don't, right? And so the things that we do have control over are our classroom environment. 
We have control over how we screen kids. We have control over the reading instruction that we implement in our core instruction and supplemental instruction for kids who, who struggle. Um, in some cases, we can control early childhood experiences, but we can't control things, some, everything. But I think we need to think really critically about what are the things we can control and how can we impact those to change reading achievement. Okay, so what does the science of reading tell us about how early reading develops? So, we know that reading is not the same as language. So it is not natural. And this is really, really important. Most human beings are born with the ability to produce and understand language, but our brains were not made to read. If you think about reading, it is a generally recent phenomenon. Um, and so our brains were not necessarily set up to do that, but we can make that happen. We can t especially teach kids how to read. We also know that when kids, individuals are skilled readers, um, they automatically recognize words. So anyone in this room who's a skilled reader, you read very effortlessly, likely. But what's happening in your brain is you're actually making connections between each individual letter and the sound, right? And so that's happening, you, you just do it. You don't know that you're doing it, but you are when you're an efficient reader. Um, and so what we need to think about is then if kids who are learning how to read are not skilled readers, how do we sort of explicitly make those connections? We know that explicit and systematic instruction of foundational reading skills such as phonics, phonemic awareness, um, with simultaneous high quality language and meaning-based instruction is how you get to reading comprehension. And I'm gonna talk about that right now. So there's a theory in an empirically validated framework for reading development called the simple view of reading. Most, a lot of people have heard about this and basically what it says is that you need to decode or be able to read words and you also need to have linguistic comprehension or oral language in order to have reading comprehension. And it's a product, right? And so each individual in this room has strengths and weaknesses on either side of this. Um, it's called the simple view of reading, but it's not simplistic. I think this is really, really important. It's, it's, it is, um, we need to think about how do we push on these levers? How do we develop both linguistic comprehension and oral language in the early grades with simultaneous explicit and systematic instruction in decoding and encoding? Because that's how you get to reading comprehension. And then we also know that fluency is really, really important. When we talk about fluency, it's about a kid's ability to read connected text on a page in a fluent um, and accurate way. So, um, and, we, and reading comprehension is the goal. And we can use the simple view to think about um, instructional targets. And we can also use the simple view to think about difficulties that potential readers have. So um, one way to think about this is um, how, do, what, so if, if you are a teacher in a classroom and you're working with a kid who's struggling with reading or reading comprehension, part of your job is to figure out why, right? And it's not always the same reason. Often it's because they're a poor, dis, poor decoder, so they're having a hard time reading words. Sometimes we have those kids, and anyone who's an educator has seen this child who can read, 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 read really quickly, but they do not comprehend what they're reading. And so we need to make sure that when we are working with kids, especially kids who are struggling, that we understand what the specific skill difficulty is in order to inform our instruction. We know that there are just a lot of kids who struggle with reading and that kids don't outgrow. So what we know, we know that early identification instruction is important. And I, 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 this article is actually publicly available and I'm happy to share it. But uh, we did sort of an analysis of all the literature on early reading development and what it says in early reading instruction. And we know um, that early reading difficulties often lead to later, I've already said that. But we also know that reading difficulties can be greatly reduced when they are addressed early through a preventative model of reading instruction. So this is the K to two space, K to three. Um, we know that if you wait till fourth grade, there are, there's a lot of data, and this came out of the National Institutes of Health, to show that if you wait till fourth grade to intervene with kids who are struggling to learn how to read, it takes four times as long. Um, and so when you think about that from the res a resource lens, I think it's really important to think about how do we prevent kids getting to the place in fourth grade where they are struggling. Um, we know that in addition to high quality evidence-based core instruction, dosage is really important. And so when I think about this, I think about it through a tiered, um, through tiered systems of support, um, we really want to think about that core curriculum, that classroom-based instruction, as the preventative model, right? If that instruction is evidence-based, aligned with the science of reading, 
most kids are going to respond to that. If it's not, you're over-identifying kids for supplemental instruction. And that's also a resource issue. We wanna make sure that core instruction is really, really good. And then we think about tier three as more intensive. Now, what I wanna be really clear on is that there are absolutely kids who get core evidence-based instruction and they just still need more instruction. They need the tier two and they need the intensive intervention because there are individual differences in kids, right, and how much instruction that they need. So the whole system has to be set up and aligned and it needs to be explicit, systematic, and cumulative across the tiers. And when you think about tier two and tier three, you need to think about the instructional skills that you're targeting and the, the dosage at which you're providing it. Because scientifically based reading instruction is both about the content and the how and the why and the dosage, right? It's, it's, it's both of those things. It's not just about content, it's about the implementation. Okay, so I'm gonna end here really quickly. I just wanna point out that there are just many, many levers to push on here. Um, I have been involved in almost every single one of these levers since I arrived in Virginia three years ago. What my job is higher education and sort of making sure that the teachers that we are producing at UVA are coming out with everything I just talked about plus more. That has been my charge for three years. Um, and then state level policies, we need to ensure that there's evidence-based curriculum, um, that we are providing our in-service teachers with professional development who may have not gotten that instruction from their teacher credential institution. They need professional development and, they, and this is a road, this is a journey for teachers. Um, I've never met an educator who wants to get reading wrong. And I think it's really, really important to keep that at the forefront of our minds. Because this is not about teacher blame. This is about making sure our teachers have the tools that they need to implement evidence-based instruction. And then access to services, ensuring that all kids, all kids have access to appropriate services and making sure we are partnering with our parents in this process. Um, I wrote an op-ed about this recently, about how we need to push on all these levers at the same time, because like I said, there is no silver bullet here. It has to be comprehensive. And I think I'm stopping there. Oh, I take away five, but you've heard all this. So uh, <laughs> reading comprehension requires both word reading and language instruction, both are important. So this is not about pushing a phonics only agenda. I think science of reading often gets a bad rap in that it's a push for phonics only. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it has to be explicit and systematic and it has to include both. We know there's a solid evidence base about how you teach early word reading. We also know how to screen for early reading difficulties and that needs to be aligned with the science. And we know that both of these things are really, really important to prevent reading difficulties. And now I promise I'm stopping. Well, that was impressive. I think I've, I've never seen 25 slides go by so so engage, in such engagement and also informative at the same time. So I think we're gonna hold all the questions right to the end of the presentation and we're gonna kind of pivot back here um, to some information about what's going on in Fairfax. But I think that's a great context um, for the work that we're engaging in. So just as a reminder, we're gonna kind of look at some a little bit of data and then really talk about what's happening and where we're going. As Dr. Presidio said, we only included a couple slides just as, as sort of a reinforcement to um, some of the data that exists. There is more data in the narrative that was posted as well, but taking a look at this, this is our reading pass rates. Um, it's combined, grades three through 12. You'll see it over three years, the 1718, the 1819, and then the 2021, remembering um, that we did not have a 1920 SOL. So Taking a look, the, the little bars, um, or I should say the lines that are on each bar represent the state averages. So taking a look at that data, I think what's easy to see is that um, we did have some um, dip, some pandemic dip across all the different groups. And we also um, should remember that these were new tests this year and with new standards. So um, that data is a little bit, um, a little bit uh, different than the first two years. We also had a little bit lower participation rate, about 30% lower in participation. But taking all that and putting all that aside, I think it's pretty clear to say that we can notice some um, significant and persistent gaps over time. And this is when we're looking at our three through 12 SOL um, pass rates. Now we don't take, we do not take the SOL in the earlier grades. So this is, um, this is data representative from our iReady screening assessment. This one is our um, K2 combined, the grade level separate are in the, are in the narrative. But what we used is the, um, the iReady designation of on or above grade level, right? So students 
uh, in these different subgroups over the three years that based on the iReady um, indicator of on or above grade level. So when we look at this, um, a couple things that point out to me is we have the same persistent gaps. We have the same, um, we have the same issues of, um, of subgroups or different groups of students uh, with wide variance in performance. But I think it also says to me that everybody has room to grow, right? That it's not just, um, this is not just an issue for some students. Um, this is something that we want to look at for, for all students. Now, when we look at that, um, just circling back to something that Dr. Solari brought up, is this, this idea of educational equity. And I think we've talked about that in some different settings um, over, over the past few months, is really this idea of the elimination of predictability. I think FCPS is committed to equity in the center. We are committed to um, eliminating that predictability, but our data right now does not show that commitment, right? So we know that we need to take some actions and we need to make some, some continuous improvements to ensure that we are um, moving forward and, and, as this states, eliminating that predictability. So when we started this work um, pre-pandemic um, on, on, uh, with uh, Ms. Lisma's idea of coming up with an equitable access to literacy plan, we had to kind of set it aside because everything went to um, school closure and pandemic. When we picked it back up in the spring, we recognized, looking at the data, if we took the time to do the plan the way we wanted to do the plan, it was going to take us several months to actually write a plan. And we don't have time to wait for that. Um, so we needed to do some things with urgency. So what you see up here is two tracks, two parallel tracks. The blue representing what's been happening really since the spring. What have we put in place for this year immediately to try and really, um, as Dr. Slaughter mentioned, really focus in on those early, early learners. What are we doing for K2? We know we had limited time, we had limited resource, and we wanted to just dig right in on that early grade level. And we'll talk about what that's looked like. The larger is the idea of this, is this equitable access to literacy plan. You know, as Dr. Slari mentioned, it's not a one thing that's going to really change the trajectory of our data. It's multiple things. So that plan is our way of, of really being very intentional and very explicit in um, how we're going to move forward. So why did we, again, why did we really look at and what were we trying to accomplish with some of these immediate changes? We really wanted to ensure that um, though we wanted to stay committed, as we always have, to the five domains of reading, we knew that we did not have that systematic, that explicit, that cumulative phonics that was guaranteed. And we wanted to get that in place as soon as possible for our K-2. So that was a big piece of, of this um, quick response. We also, with the ESSER funds, um, the board has really um, approved our way, uh, our methodology of moving forward with intervention. And we wanted to bring that into alignment with this work. And finally, it's the ongoing professional development needs to ensure that both our teachers and our leaders are well-versed in, um, in this work. So these were some of the things we wanted to get started on right away prior to developing the larger plan. I am not gonna read all of these things to you, but let me hit just a couple highlights that I think may be of interest. One is a professional development, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a hallmark of really um, successful implementation. This, as Dr. Solari said, a simple reading, a simple view of reading sounds simple, but it's not simplistic. So people need to have time to build their background knowledge and really to understand this work. So we have started professional development with um, our teachers, we, are, uh, we will start with our principals this month, and we are continuing the professional development within central office to ensure everyone that works in central office is also grounded in the science of reading and is able to really um, lead this work and support and coach teachers effectively. I'm gonna jump down to here to resources. This is a big one, and this is actually a big one for the school board as well. On Thursday night, um, uh, for new business, there will be an, an item around the appointing the committee. So we are in process of an elementary basal resource adoption. And that starts with a request for proposals, which we're currently in that process, so I can't share lots of details, um, but we are in that process and we're getting ready to wrap that up and start the community review over the next month where anybody in the community can look at the resources that have, been, have come out of the RFP. Um, and then we will start the committee review, and that's the part we're asking school boards to appoint members to starting this week and over the next, um, several weeks. The idea here is though we've been very quick to start things and get, um, get some things in place, 
this is a great opportunity. The timing could not be better. We have not bought a basal resource in 20 years for language art, for elementary language arts, and therefore, and therefore, this is going to be um, an opportunity to take what we are, where we are going right now, and match that with appropriate resources. Um, you know, timing could not really be better for us. Now we are reckoning that this is a big purchase, so um, it will be split over two years. So July of 22 and July of 23, and um, we can talk more about that if you have questions. But we are super excited about the process, and we were able to set the requirements to ensure that there would be that alignment for the science of reading and also the inclusiveness of um, special education, ESOL, and ensure that we're getting resources that will, will fit the bill. So excited to share more about that as, as that process comes about. Just very quickly with the assessments, we did put in a required developmental spelling assessment for all students this year. It's a tough year, you all know that in the schools, and so anything we're adding that's required, we have to do really intentionally and we have to support. Um, so I know the schools are busy with iReady testing and BGA testing and developmental spelling. They're, they are working to get all of these assessments done, which will help us with core instruction and also with intervention. The curriculum development piece, um, I know a lot of people say, why is Fairfax always right everything? Why do we always have to write our own? Well, because we're buying a basal resource, we weren't going to buy something this year and then buy something new next year. So what the lessons we've put in, though we believe they're high quality and will be able to continue to be used in some fashion, um, may be replaced with the resource that we choose. So um, this, what, why we wrote so much for this summer, we wanted to make sure that teachers were supported with daily lessons. We could not leave this up to teachers to have to figure it out and create. Um, and we knew that it was a bridge to when we get to our basal resources. I'm gonna move past that a little bit and I just wanna make a little bit of a connection to the ESSER, the ESSER plan because it is important. The ESSER plan, we know students are coming back, we're just getting data in and students are um, showing that they have fallen behind and we have more kids in need. So what we do with those ESSER funds, the plans that the schools are currently putting together and um, trying to get their data and determine what will be their intervention strategies is gonna be critically important. So though back in the spring, we didn't really know that this was gonna be part of our immediate work with this literacy work, it has turned into actually a very large span and it also allows us to go beyond that K2 and start doing some things that are um, 312. Dr. McConnell just came on and this was one of the first things she really had to dig into because she had to really look at the kinds of interventions that we were thinking of doing and ensuring that we elevated the interventions we have in place that actually are aligned with the science of reading, um, which supports the new um, bill that is also passed um, in the state of Virginia. So lots going on there. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there for a moment and just to take a breath, just so that we have a demarcation that that's all the stuff we've been doing. Now we wanna kind of move and talk about what we want to do and what we're, where we're going with this work, okay? So I know it can get confusing when we've got a lot of different things going on. So we are in the process, um, in the beginning stages really, and, and glad to be here with you tonight to start to, to, to bring you all into the conversation of developing a pre-K-12 Equitable Access to Literacy Plan or EAL plan. The idea behind this plan was really came about for um, a few different reasons. One, the board has had a longstanding goal, um, goal one, student success, right, to, to eliminate gaps and to ensure that all students um, are ready for success in school and life. So we needed to find ways to actualize that goal. We also know that, that our gaps, as we looked in the data, they're persistent and, and they're significant. A couple other things that we really want to tackle with this plan is that we believe that um, our numbers are, we have over identification of students that are found uh, eligible for special education, perhaps due to, um, due to our, our reading achievement at this time. And we believe that one factor that we can look at is the reading instruction. And then the final one is really thinking longer term. I think um, Dr. Presidio talked about it, Dr. Solari. You know, when you get to high school and you have to take a reading intervention class, maybe in ninth grade, maybe in 10th grade, that's taking options away from kids. It's taking options away from kids where they would rather be in an arts class or a STEM class. And, and of course, they need to do what they need to do, but if we could get to a place where students, not as many students at least, need intervention, it would provide opportunity for CTE. And, and we all know what gets kids to, to school. 
it is those opportunities for many of our kids that make school the place to be. So all of these things are reasons, um, and all of these things are things we want to really keep in mind as we are developing this plan. Now, one of the things that's a struggle is that, that we can create a great plan. We probably could, you know, shut down things for a week and write a plan and we'd be all done, but it would not be very inclusive and it would not necessarily capture all the voices that we need to do, um, that we need to hear from, and it would be really hard to implement that way. So we are trying to set up more of a project management structure in order to do this, um, just the creation of the plan and then the implementation. So just starting with the creation is where we are now, is we've created a steering committee and several of the members um, that have come to several meetings already since June are with us today and I really appreciate you being, being here with us. But we have a steering committee that has met monthly just to start to lay the groundwork and create the vision and the commitments um, that we are working through and I'll share in just a moment. But you'll notice we have um, a few different community stakeholder groups and um, that have met with us and then we pair that with uh, some school school based leaders both reading teachers and principals as well as central office leaders and we've been just meeting to just sort of get grounded and get started on this work now obviously that group of people is not going to be doing the writing they're not going to be doing a lot of the work so we are going to be organizing the rest of to, to move this plan forward into work teams and you'll see the list there there are I think that's eight different work teams in order to um, make sure that we are bringing people together from across central office, ISD, DSS, DSIS, Title I, and school-based people together to, to kind of monitor all the different parts of the plan and ensure that we are, are moving forward together. So those work teams will have multiple um, people and then the leaders of those work teams will come together as a core team. So it's probably a little more than you needed about the, the project management plan, but this is a big lift and we need everybody moving and pushing in the same direction. So a working vision, um, the, the committee has worked on this and we'll be kind of finalizing it when we meet in next, next week um, to really just kind of focus in on some of the key elements here that it is going to be a pre-K-12 plan, that it does need to be grounded in the science of reading and that we really have the aim of, of reaching that educational equity. Now that doesn't say a whole lot of the specifics, so we get a little bit, we go a little bit deeper, right? And we get into some of our, our commitment to system-wide fidelity. And that's one of our biggest challenges, it always is, is how do we get to a place where, we're, um, uh, where we have fidelity in this? But our commitment as we do this work, I think the first bullet, I'm not gonna read these two and I'll just hit a couple, is really speaking to our, our desire to Take a step back and put everything on the table. Look at our data, look at our practices, watch, that, uh, watch uh, the achievement uh, gap information and, and what are our policies and our practices and what are our resources and everything is kind of on the table. So that first bullet is really our commitment to, to, to kind of interrogate ourselves. We are definitely committed to that um, daily explicit systematic and cumulative instruction. Talked about that already a little bit. The multi-tiered systems of support, I think um, when we had the SR3 and all through the pandemic, you all have been hearing about the MTSS, the MTSS, that's something that, that we are seeing strengthen. We know we have ways to go, but it continues to strengthen and things like this plan and the ESSER plan puts a whole different kind of focus and spotlight um, on, on those types of structures and will be really critical to ensure that we're meeting tier one needs as well as tier two and tier three. Uh, the next few are really about deepening, um, deepening the knowledge of our educators and just to, you know, I think it is important and Dr. Slari said it so well, this isn't about just one thing, it's not about phonics. And as we think about equity, we can't really think about equity without thinking about our commitment to culture responsive pedagogies. So this is bigger than just one thing um, and we are committed to um, the professional development on on both of those things. And then finally, really ensuring that we have ongoing communication with families and caregivers. Um, we will need to be partners in this. We have partner literacy programs with families and we know those kinds of things make a difference. The plan itself will have many components. I, um, and of course, I'm talking theoretically right now because there is no plan. I'm not gonna hand you a plan when this is all over, but we wanna make sure that we are looking at all these different components that are going to be necessary in order to be inclusive in order to be comprehensive. And I think that's really, um, I think that's really going to take some, um, 
some work to ensure that we're collaborating with our different stakeholders, that our schools are partners in this, and that we're, uh, we're all coming together. Some of the things I would hit on um, here is really the accountability. Like how are we gonna have accountability not only for the outcomes but for the implementation. So those are things that we want documented and we want to be clear about our intention. We have Dr. Solari here as an example of our intent to partner with experts. We do not yet have a formalized uh, agreement with UVA but we have been talking with her about how we might have a more formal MOU so that we can ensure. Um, we know, you know, you can one, you can fall back into things you can have blind spots, you have lots of things. Even as wonderful as the amazing staff in Fairfax County is, we need extra eyes, we need extra help, we need reminders, and, and we're open to that, and we are excited to have these kinds of partnerships. Partnerships to provide um, input, partnerships to provide uh, expertise, maybe to provide professional development. It just really, I think some of that will unfold, but we are definitely open to that. So that was a lot of me talking, and I'm gonna turn it over for just a couple minutes to um, Dr. Leipzig, who's gonna just give you a moment of principal perspective. Thank you so much, and thank you. I am honored to talk about a subject very near and dear to my heart. As a principal um, of Canterbury Woods Elementary, I kinda of want us to take a breath. That was a lot. And our educators are feeling so overwhelmed with this pandemic recovery, which we're not quite done with. And so I just wanted to spend a couple minutes to say why, even in the weeds, we desperately need this work. First, it's best for all students. We've heard a lot about students who we wanna catch early, we wanna intervene as soon as possible, but there is no harm in having every child have a rich and deep understanding of the code of the language that they use every day. There is no harm in having excellent structured instruction for every child. And having that access is so important because as both Noel and Dr. Solari said, we don't know exactly who's going to need it the most. We have a good suspicion based on our data but we know that these skills are essential to every child. We see that our data, and this you know, is true at every school, um, that we see our data is pointing with some big flashing lights to some skills that have not been present in core as they've needed to be. And our response as schools is to try to use the multi-tiered systems of supports process to fill those gaps in, but that's not sufficient. Multi-tiered systems of supports is meant to be an addition to core, but if you've got two hours of language arts block that is not meeting a child's needs and you're finding 25 minutes a day to fill in a gap that they never got access to to begin with, it's just not efficient, it's not sufficient, and it's not equitable. So the how. We are thrilled with the 15 minute a day lessons. My teachers love them. They are happy that there are some ready to use resources so that they can get this work in place in K-2 quickly. And we know that transformation doesn't happen with 15 minutes a day. But the only way we're going to be able to help not just expose students, but hold them accountable to learn these skills is by having the teacher drive that transformation. And teachers can't drive the, the transformation without extensive professional development. I just hired a teacher from UVA, super grateful for the background that they're getting now, but I have a whole school of teachers who have not had the access to the very important information about science of reading and a deep understanding of reading development and acquisition that would help them understand why and how they can make sure that these kids develop these skills. So in order for that transformation to occur, we have got to give these teachers time. There are a couple of things that have to change. They have to change their understandings about how a child becomes an expert reader. They have to change their understandings of what to do if they're not seeing that automaticity right at the beginning, if the child is going to require some additional 
support. They're going to need time to understand how to read these data in a way that it will help drive them towards the right practices. And they're going to need time to develop the practices, to develop that toolbox that is flexible and ready to address a variety of needs that they find in those assessments. So I know that it sounds like tonight, it's a huge ask, and it isn't, we can't oversimplify, but I do think that in Fairfax, sometimes we really try to take on more without saying, what can we let go? And what I would say about this work is less is more. Our teachers, as I mentioned, are working with so many needs as they're working on this pandemic recovery, and they know that the work we do in literacy is essential. And there are a lot of things we would reorganize so that if our focus is making sure that foundational skill acquisition is of, of tantamount importance, there are some other tried and true practices that we can let go of that may not be helping us work towards those goals. And furthermore, the pedagogical approaches, the how we teach, the how we teach isn't quite working for the kids who are coming to us right now. We're trying to recover and put the social and emotional needs of our students in, in the driver's seat. And what we're finding is we've got to figure them out all over again and use the pedagogies and the strategies that are going to work for the kids in front of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So just a couple slides left and then we'll turn it over um, to, to you all. And I think um, it's been a bit, a bit of a theme about planning time um, and about professional development tonight, about uh, really being able to ensure that teachers are supported, right? That teachers are supported as we ask them to make, make this change. Um, some budgetary things that we have over on the right, it's not extensive, but I just wanted to kind of point out, we talked about basal, resource, basal resources. We're not asking for new money that's built into the budget that ha started to happen a f um, several years ago where financial services put us on a cycle. So we're, there's no ask there, which is a, I think a good thing because that is a big ticket item. And I think um, you all actually restored some money for us. So thank you very much for that. Um, we are gonna look at how we might do intensified summer professional development um, in this coming summer. That is a challenge because we know teachers are going, if we're not sure teachers are gonna be really excited about coming this summer. So we're really gonna have to think about capturing who we can and what are the alternatives and how do we move people forward. So it's, it's not a simple thing, but it's um, something that we have been able to do in the past using Title II funds. So we're going to look to continue to leverage that. Now this year we were able to, um, we have a, a, a smaller VDOE grant which will expire at the end of the year. We have a few extra resource teachers. So that is something that we have um, no source for in the future. Now, as the plan develops, obviously there may be, there may be some additional asks um, over the next couple months, but we didn't have any specifics, so I didn't want to come with, um, with anything more than that tonight. And just, just to, to sum it up, I think all of these things we've talked about, but we do want to really um, ensure that as we're doing this work that we are affirming the families and the students and the experiences that they have had. Um, we've had many families reach out over the years to talk about the experiences. Um, that their children have had or the struggles they've had and we want to ensure that we are um, that we are listening and we want to ensure that we are assessing using data to to drive this work we need to make sure that we are in, um, looking at all sorts of data sources in order to make um, our our plan and then finally to advance the work um, I think these are all things that I've mentioned, so I won't, I won't go into them, but we have lots on our plate right now, right? We have a lot going on in the pandemic, but this is of the highest priority. We spend many, we have taken a lot of our resources, both time and money to, to, um, to divert to this work, because I think we all agree that it's incredibly important and we've got some immediate next steps and we're really looking forward to the creation of the larger plan. So with that, I will turn it back over to our meeting managers. Thank you, and uh, Dr. Solari, Ms. Klamenko, and Dr. Lipsig, thank you so much for this very comprehensive um, report and update to help us. It is a lot to grasp, 
Um, but we appreciate you uh, breaking it down for us and giving us that information. And thank you to also all of you committee members who are here, who have worked on this already. Thank you so much. We appreciate the work you've already done and I know you will continue to work with us on that. So thank you. And with that, I will start with board questions and I have Ms. Keys Gamaro followed by Ms. Ms. Corbett Sanders followed by Ms. Keys Gamaro. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I feel like we're actually at the end of the beginning or the middle of the beginning of developing a plan. And so um, I will say that I thought we'd be a little further along than uh, this tonight, but that at least we've got a plan to build a plan. So that's good and I appreciate that. I do have some questions because um, a couple of things. One, we know that our, um, there are certain groups that are being left behind more than other groups. And they include our Hispanics, our L's, our students with disabilities, economically um, disadvantaged, and our black students. When you add it all up, it's about like, what, 60% of our student body? That's a pretty large chunk that we're leaving behind, folks. So I just, A, want to give a sense of urgency that um, we started talking about this last spring and we need to have a real plan with real measures of effectiveness and how we're going to make sure that we do it with fidelity sooner rather than later. Because as somebody who didn't know how to read in second grade, this is personal to me. I don't want to see this happen to other kids. The second thing is, um, especially for our L's, we know that literacy in their base language will also give some sense of security and confidence in learning. What are we doing to build that into this plan? I think it's very important. What are we doing to ensure that we have um, fluidity in literacy for our students who may be using assisted devices? I looked at your um, list of stakeholders and I didn't see someone from IT. And so I'd like to know what we're doing for that piece. And then um, I found it fascinating when you said uh, that it, we need to be willing to let things go, take things off the plate of our staff. And this is something that coincidentally, uh, we just had this conversation in our budget discussion. So I would like to hear from you, what should we take off the plate? So I appreciate, um, I appreciate that sentiment because I think it shows our awareness that our teachers are overwhelmed. And in terms of what to let go, it's really about aligning our practices with the simple view of reading that Dr. Solari spoke about. So those are two big ingredients. The first ingredient, making sure that students have decoding and encoding skills. We know how to do that through science of reading. And if we are aligning our practices for transfer, it means that we need students to practice those skills. We can't just expose them to it in a 15 minute lesson and then use materials and stru structures that are not allowing them to practice those skills. So one thing we could look at is our materials and what we use so that we can ensure students have a chance to practice the skills for transfer. But another, I think, big piece of the puzzle, the other side of reading instruction, or the other side of the equation is linguistic com uh, comprehension or oral language. So we actually can be working on that side of the equation all day long. We have really, I think, in an effort to be as, have as much time as possible for language arts instruction, we've edged out science and social studies. But what we know about science and social studies is that's where we learn vocabulary and our concepts about the world and our background knowledge. So it's about being efficient with our reading and writing instruction, but recognizing that we are creating literate individuals all day long by making sure that we are leaning into the linguistic power of every lesson we teach them. But I defer to you our expert if she has additional things she would let go. <laughs> um, 
I, I think I'll just make a brief comment here. I think, you know, first I want to point out that Fairfax is not alone in this and that there are many divisions and districts across the country who are look, taking a very critical look at their early reading instruction. There's also a lot of national level data that shows that about 65 to 70 percent of curricula being used in the core area is not aligned with the science of reading. And so I think this basal adoption process is really, really important. Um, but on top of that, I mean, I'm sure that there are practices that are happening in elementary classrooms that are things that teachers have just been doing for a while, but they're not necessarily evidence-based. And because we do have such a profound and deep knowledge of how to teach kids how to read words, how to decode that one side of the equation based on evidence, they really need to be implementing those practices. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but. Well, I think what you're saying is that everybody has ownership of part of the literacy puzzle. And what we've done in the past is we've had silos. We've had our reading silo, and we've had our history, our silo, our art silo, and our math silo. But the reality is you can't be proficient in math unless you know how to read, because you can't solve those problems. And so having that cross um, section approach is what you're talking about, but that actually sounds like you're putting more on people's plates, so I keep coming back to what do you take off their plates? Well, one thing I would say is I, I know the board's gonna be having some discussion and conversation about priorities for us uh, as a school system, and making sure that this literacy work is the number one priority will be really, really important because we're always good as leaders at identifying new things that we want to do or things that we want to expand. Um, and coming out of a pandemic, I think there's interest and urgency in trying to get back to normal and you know, let's start to think about our improvement practices as a, as a system overall, but we've got to focus on the work that's most important. So I think it's gonna take a lot of discipline for all of us as leaders to say, we need to create the time and space for schools to focus on this work because this work is that important and as Dr. Leipzig said people only have so much bandwidth in the schools to take on new work um, and this is a significant shift that we're asking many people to make and we need to create the time and space for that. The other thing I would say is you had two other really good questions and I would just respond to them briefly about you know how are we supporting our English language learners and how we're supporting on some of our special populations with assistive technology and I would just say very briefly um, we are working with our committee to basically have subcommittees that will look at some of our special populations in more detail um, because we know that there's a lot of additional work that needs to happen there. Um, Rich Polio is here. If there's more specific questions, he can answer them in more detail about what we're doing for English language learners. But remember, we do have a plan for English language development and acquisition that we use uh, specifically for our English language learners. So what we have to do is we have to find the nexus of that plan with what needs to happen in core instruction and tier one instruction for all of our students, but with a sufficient understanding of the particular needs that English language learners have for that literacy development in their native language. And very importantly, to really understand, to make sure that all of our teachers understand how to assess English language learners to understand when is there a, a challenge that a student needs support with English language development as opposed to very specific strategies in reading development and what does that look like and, and how do you make those instructional decisions and what data do you use to do that. Um, similarly, we need to do that same work with many of our uh, special populations, particularly students that might be using an adaptive curriculum or that might be in our deaf and hard of hearing program. So that, those are subcommittees that need to really build out our plan with those populations in mind. So are those committees being put in place and are we putting as, as a SMART goal for people's professional development, literacy as a goal across everybody's? Well, every, every school improvement plan is going to be focused at the elementary level in particular um, with goals related to literacy as part of the academic recovery plan. So, so that will be true and then principals will be working with teachers around their individual SMART goals. But we have the right people on the committee. <laughs> it's creating, again, more opportunities for them to have more time to focus on that work in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. keys Gamaro, and then she, uh, she will be followed by Mr. Frisch. 
Thank you. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you for coming down from coming up from uh, UVA. Thank you for our advocates that helped bring this to our attention. And I um, have to say, you have raised a sense of urgency for me. And I have four basic points. Number one, there's a realization here that how critical this is. But I've also heard something today that I typically don't hear and you brought this out, doctor, that our outcomes in the state of Virginia are impacted by race. And that is different than what we've heard in other, you know, according to the data that you reported to us. That's significant to me because I think sometimes we have a hard time recognizing that, talking about that, and realizing that it does have an impact in learning and access to opportunity. So I wanna thank you for coming here today and, and unashamedly telling us that and helping us to learn uh, from your experience. I think, Dr. Brabrand, that this also means that we are gonna need help understanding what is too much, right? And so I, I, I kinda, I know my colleague asked about that, but I think that there has to be a plan to figure out what is too much. How are we going to hear from our staff members? How are we going to hear from our equity teams? How are we going to hear from the various regions? And so going forward, I would like to hear how we plan to do that. Because it seems to me that we can't do this with, unless that is a part of the plan. Um, it's also critical to hear, not only to hear staff, but to hear our parents and to understand, for example, how does this look different for our Title I schools? Right, we already have needs-based uh, staffing, et cetera. Is there a difference? I don't know, but it seems to me that this has to be part of the discussion. I think it's critical to also utilize our parents and our community, which you have a plan to do, but parents are going to want to know how they can be a part of this process in a positive way, and that's gonna be a part of that communications part. You knew I was gonna say that, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you knew we would get to that. And then lastly, I would say critical to fund, right? And so I'm glad we're having this right alongside the budget priorities. Um, and I, I'll just stop there and see if anyone has any comments in case I need to have a, something to say in response. And I think those are excellent points. I mean, I, I've noted many of those. Um, so definitely those are things that we can continue to update the board on in future discussion and future presentations. But um, I appreciate you raising the importance of a communication plan, a family engagement plan. Um, definitely the idea of how much is too much mm -hmm. for our schools to take on and, and what resources do we need to do this well. So thank you. So I'd like to ask our doctor, with respect to getting people to understand this component that we have had, you know, we're getting different data in the state of Virginia the seat of the Confederacy. How do we wake people up and help figure out how to deal with that? I know I'm, I might be asking for your dissertation, but um, to what extent can you speak to us about that? Yeah, I think a part of this, you know, I've, I've had multi, I think about this a lot. This is something I think about a lot. And how do you create awareness around this? Um, because I think it, this is really important. You know, we, I've been working with the Equity Center at UVA around literacy outcomes um, for kids, uh, children of color, and kids with disabilities, and uh, sort of we we actually now have a publicly facing site that sort of goes through division by division to show the discrepancies between um, white children and black children, and white children and English learners, and white children and Hispanic children on the SOLs for the last 20 years. And really, that is just about awareness. I just don't think we talk about it enough. Um, and so you can't change anything until we all, uh, you know, acknowledge that this is a thing, right? And so for me, it's more about an awareness campaign, and then and then coupling that awareness campaign with an action plan. So how do you address it? Because you, you have to be very, very explicit and systematic in how you're going to address it. So I probably doesn't totally answer your question, but I do think the first step is awareness, and that's why I talk about it. So I'd like to just say I want to make sure we focus on the Title I schools as a part of that, uh, since you know those populations will be impacted. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. <coughs> um, excuse me, can we stop my time for a second? <coughs> I'm sorry. 
um, if I could get those five seconds back. Um, first, I want to say that I'm uh, incredibly grateful for this work session. And if my inbox is to be any indication, I think parents and advocates are as well. Uh, Dr. Solari, I want to thank you for joining us and sharing your expertise. Uh, I'm glad this worked out uh, after we traded emails a while back. Um, we hear words uh, like science of reading and structured literacy thrown around quite a bit, as you noted. Uh, they often mean different things to different people. You helped by defining science of reading, but I'm curious about the converse. What are the common misconceptions? How are these terms most commonly misused? Sure. I mean, I could talk about that for an hour, but <laughs> I think the most common are one that folks who are pushing for a science of reading have a phonics only agenda. And I think that's really, I mean, that is just not true. When we're, when we're talking about science of reading, we're talking about both sides of the equation, really explicit and systematic phonics instruction with also um, oral language instruction. Um, I also think one really common misconception that's important is that science of reading is not, you know, it's not a specific curriculum. It's not a specific um, instructional practice. It's a body of evidence that tells us how kids learn how to read and why some kids struggle, and we can use that to inform our practice. So I often get asked, well, what's the one curricula you, curriculum you would recommend based on the science of reading? And my response is there's no such thing as a perfect curriculum. Like, it just doesn't exist. There are certainly some that are stronger than others. But um, it just doesn't exist. So I, so I just wanted to get out of that sort of mindset that like, oh, we're going to be able to fix this by implementing this one th curriculum. That's just not, it's important. But there's so many other things we have to push on simultaneously. Thank you. Uh, what are the major challenges you've observed in school divisions that are working to realign their literacy plans with the science of reading? Can you talk about any roadblocks we should anticipate and try to mitigate how do large school systems address fidelity of implementation as they approach this type of work? I think the main thing that people do is underestimate the time it takes to make significant change in reading. Um, often what you see, you know, and I think importantly from the professional development side, um, this is a process. I mean, we, I have done several randomized control trials in schools where we are providing years long interve our intervention, but also professional development of teachers of this is what core instruction that's evidence-based looks like. This is what supplemental tier two instruction looks like. Um, and it's a learning process for the teachers. They have to build knowledge and they have to build the, what do I do tomorrow in my classroom, right? And which is, which is actually what teachers want to know. What do I do? What do I do tomorrow in my classroom? And so underestimating the amount of time that this takes, I think is one of the biggest mistakes. And then people will give it a year, 18 months and say, oh, it's not working, we're moving on to the next thing. So I would really encourage you to think about this as a multi-year plan. Um, this is a huge investment that's gonna take multiple years. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I think we need to be really cognizant about teacher buy-in. Because like I said before, there's not a single educator who wants to get reading wrong, but a lot of our teachers have been implementing practices that they thought were right. And we wanna make sure that we're not um, you know, blaming teachers or blaming administrators. I mean, this is really just about, hey, we know some, some other stuff now and we're gonna try these new practices. And also the third thing is the pile on, which we sort of have, I call this the pile on, which we've sort of talked about already is, you can't just say, now you're gonna add in 15 minutes of uh, foundational skills instruction on type of your guide and reading, on top of your oral reading fluency, on, type of, on top of your read alouds. There has to be give and take, and there has to be a really, um, there has to be a strategy by which if you have 90 minutes of English language arts instruction or two hour, whatever it is, two hours of English language arts instruction, um, that you are telling teachers how much time to spend on each area and that helps you get rid of some of the things you don't want them to do anymore because they're not practices based in evidence. You can't just pile on, you do have to take some of the practices out. I appreciate that and I, I recognize that as a theme tonight. Uh, for staff, can you talk about the timeline for development of this plan? Are there benchmarks or installments? Can you go into any more detail here? And if not, when can we expect more detail? 
So to be honest, we have not set a, a due date for ourselves, and I think, um, I think that is critical, and I think it's a very fair question. I will say that. Um, one of the, the challenges we want to ensure that we're being collaborative and we're bringing all the people together, and that always takes time, but we don't want that to be a roadblock to actually creating a plan and, and bringing that forward. So I'll ask uh, Mr. Frisch if you just give us a, a little bit of time to put together more of a um, comprehensive timeline for you. Thursday morning? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we're all eager, and I know you all are too. Um, another subject, uh, I have significant worries uh, about system-wide implementations, particularly around fidelity of implementation. What steps can we take to provide school-level transparency around implementation and impact? What shape do you see the eventual plan taking place here um, in that regard? I think one of the things that we have to um, we have to do relatively quickly is be incredibly clear with our school personnel where we're going, what this is going to look like when we have arrived, right? Because I think um, you know right now they're trying to to implement the 15 minutes, or they're trying to do this, or they're trying to do that. But we need to make sure that everyone has a clear vision of what reading instruction, what that language arts block would look like when we're done, and the clear path to get there. I think that one thing. Um, I think is 100% true that if you don't know where you're going, it's very hard for people to get on board and go with you. So we do need to be clear about that. So that's one of our first things that we need to start to do as we bring those administrators in in October. We've given them taste, like we're giving you tonight, but we haven't given them enough. The other piece is obviously we always want to work closely with, um, with not only the regions, but with all of our partners in Title I, in the Office of School Support, and, um, uh, special services and special education, we need to make sure everybody is on board because we all need to have collective responsibility around this work. It's not going to be just a few people who can who can make this happen and convince everybody. It's going to be everybody pushing this in the same direction. So I think the first thing is really bringing, making sure that all the stakeholders have a clear vision of where we're going, and that's kind of where the plan comes in, is, is really all those different parts. And then... Um, ensuring that we have the accountability, the timelines, the deliverables to um, to stay on track. I don't know. But when it is time, I'm sure many of us will want to see how it's being done in every every school that we represent. Understood. Um, on the subject of, in oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say understood. <laughs> okay. Um, how do we make sure that our commitment to equity and literacy extends beyond our youngest students to our older students with reading challenges? Can we commit to evidence-based plans and implementation with fidelity for all students? So the, the plan really is about all students and is, is pre-K-12. And I know that we spent a lot of time talking about what we're doing immediately and that, that very much focuses on our youngest learners. Um, I think we are really trying to, to not let another group of kindergartners, first graders, and second graders move forward without having some of these foundational skills. Um, but the bigger plan will address, and, and we're also hoping to, to actually use ESSER to help us with this as well, right, as we start to think about um, the tutoring and the interventions that schools are going to be putting in place, trying to ensure that those things are moving us in the, in the correct direction and providing the kind of instruction that we're looking for. So we're trying to leverage that in the short term until we get the, um, the larger plan rolled out. So they will be part of the plan. I think that's encouraging. And... Uh, to that end, I'm curious how we will provide professional development for those older student, the teachers of those older students, um, so that we're not pulling kids out continuously uh, for special ed services uh, because they're not getting what they need in gen ed. So where would we be providing the interventions? Is that what you were asking? Correct. Are we going to be providing enough training to make sure that we are? Oh, the professional development. Um, so that is one of the things we're really kind of thinking about with the pandemic, as we're seeing the data coming in um, and the, the, the student need um, different than what we've seen in the past, is how can we provide, um, what can we provide to teachers that will allow them to use some of these evidence-based uh, products? You know, is there, can we leverage technology perhaps um, for some of our older students to fill in some of these gaps that is not typically part of um, the secondary uh, literacy work or the secondary language arts block? So we're looking at a variety of things um, to make it 
a little bit more uh, to feed the urgency of our older kids um, because they don't have years and years left with us. So we need some products that can be more personalized and, and so really looking at what's available. If I could just add briefly to that though, I, I think it raises a really good point about how, how do you get to fidelity of professional development in, in training for teachers in a, in a system our size, we have to rely on school-based staff to be able to do that. You can't pull all of your teachers out and do a professional training when you've got you know 8,000 elementary school teachers. I mean, it, it's just not practical to do that. So we have to work with our building principals. We work with our literacy leaders, our instructional coaches, our reading specialists that are in our building. And we've been doing that all along and we'll continue to do it. But having, having time for those folks to work with the teachers side by side in a classroom, in a collaborative team meeting is really, really important. And, and that is one of the things that um, we did recommend to the board as something to look at from a policy perspective. How can we think about our calendar in the future starting next year where we have more professional development time? And how can we create more planning time, particularly for our elementary teachers, so that they have time to actually plan to implement these strategies that we're asking them to incorporate? So those are two things, professional development and planning time, that, that we'll need to continue to engage in discussion with the board about. I'm sure advocates right now are wondering if that's how it's going to be done, how are we going to deal with principals who are resistant to change? Well, I mean, again, this has to be a priority for the school system, and that means it's a priority not just for departments, but for regional leadership, and it is. Uh, we've been having those conversations as a leadership team. Dr. Brabrand, Dr. Ivey have been very clear about those expectations with all of us as system leaders on the leadership team, and we are collaborating with our region leaders, and region leaders provide that support and that coaching to principals, and um, you know, the departments are available when principals have questions or concerns about what we're doing. Uh, to provide that additional support to make sure that the implementation is smooth. So um, I think when our system is working as one um, and we have a systems-based approach to leadership, we're successful. Um, but again, when we have competing issues and competing priorities, um, that, that's where we always sub-optimize this work. So we need to keep this at the center of, of our priorities this year. I think you mentioned this briefly. Can you speak to the literacy needs of specific populations of students with disabilities, I'm thinking about intellectual disabilities, students adapted curriculum, Braille, AAC, um, et cetera. Yeah, and Dr. Boyd is here with us, and um, I'm gonna let her uh, have the first word on that. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Frisch, for the question. Um, as shared today, much of the work was talking about tier one, good universal quality instruction um, and literacy instruction. We do know for some of our students, their tier one is a replacement curriculum. We have, you know, if you think about the adapted curriculum, there's theoretically 1% of our student, pop student population that has significant cognitive disabilities. And so their core instruction is different and really is a replacement um, that's something that's separate and apart. And on the slides, Noel and Sloan talked about those additional work groups that are really gonna be focused on that. What does that specialized instruction look like for students? So that's one bucket, and that will be inclusive of um, AAC for students who have various um, access needs and things like that. And as we talk about ensuring that even as we talk about for our tier, tier one curriculum, that we have somebody at the table who is thinking about accessibility. A lot of our programs come with print and also now because we're in the 21st century, come with electronic um, resources, supplemental materials. How do we ensure that somebody's at the table to make sure that that information is accessible to students with visual impairments, students with hearing impairments, different things like that, physical um, needs. So we're doing those things, but also one of the pieces, and I know that everyone knows this, but just wanna to highlight too, that as we talk about tiered interventions, we wanna make sure that people don't have that assumption that students with disabilities, we have some students with disabilities that are performing um, phenomenally on that tier one level. We have some students that need additional targeted support that have students with disabilities and some students with disabilities that need that very, very intensive support. So I just wanted to just highlight today, and I know that everybody around, we're all singing from the same sheet of music, but they're just uplifted as we talk about tiered interventions, that's not specifically for students with disabilities. We have general ed students who need tier supports. We have students with disabilities that are progressing and thriving with tier one. Um, so that is a part of the conversation. We are working. We do currently have some materials and supplemental programs for our students with the adaptive curriculum. And just as we're doing with the core, we're coming back to the table. 
What are the strengths? Where are the opportunities? Where are our gaps? What do we need to do differently? And who else do we need to bring to the table to make sure that we don't have those, those blind spots? So I'm pretty sure my time is up. Um, and I hope that <laughs> answered part of your question. <laughs> It did. Thank you. Um, looking at slides uh, 29 and 30, um, how are we assessing reading for students who are non-SOL uh, on the VAAP track uh, and those that don't have access to iReady? Oh, with He's that. talking about the oh, VAP okay. kids. Sorry. Um, could you restate your question? Sorry, I was flipping the slides. I apologize. Yes, if we could hold my clock, because I do have one last question, and I will be very yeah. impressed that I actually okay. got all my questions <laughs> in my time. Um, so uh, how are we assessing the reading um, uh, levels of students who are on the VAP track and those who, uh, for who iReady is not available, not accessible? And we have Mr. Bloom. At Excuse me, I hope I'm called on here. Um, we do have Mr. Bloom here who can provide some additional insight, but one of the pieces to, again, um, IEP teams, as we talk about participation in division-wide assessments to include literacy assessments, math assessments, that's a decision of the IEP team, so there's not a blanketed assessment that says all students that are instructed with the adaptive curriculum won't take iReady and will take something else. So that's a key piece. And then I'll let Mike talk a little bit more um, about what, how we assess the reading needs of our students, whereby those IEP teams have determined that it would be inappropriate for them to engage in division-wide assessments, be it literacy or other division-wide assessments. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. So yes, uh, briefly, for students on an adapted curriculum, there are a number of different ways that we can assess their reading skills. Um, some of the ways that we assess skills are through uh, some either formal or informal uh, assessments. Um, you have summative assessments and formative assessments throughout the school year where teachers engage in IEP goal work, where they're taking daily data collection around IEP specific goals related to literacy. And so we do look at the IEP goals and some of the goals that students are working on to drive some of the decision making around uh, literacy decisions. Um, students on an adapted curriculum also uh, are engaged in, uh, you know, tasks that provide information to teachers um, related to their specific reading assessment data. Um, you know, students that are on the adapted curriculum also, uh, many of them are in what Dr. Boyd described as an alternate core literacy instruction. And so many of our specialized reading programs or literacy programs for students on our adaptive curriculum have progress monitoring tools that are part of that particular specialized program. And so again, through that progress monitoring tools with many of those programs, teachers are able to access certain data points that drive decision making. Appreciate that. Uh, final question. Um, do you see us eventually buying a program, purchasing it, or building it in-house? So for our basal resource adoption, um, we are looking at commercial products. All right. Final comment uh, on the question of uh, professional development. I, for one, cannot imagine how we hope to implement this plan with fidelity if we are relying on a handful of people in each building to provide professional development for others in the building. We're gonna to have to think outside the box, be more creative and spend a lot of money to make sure that everybody is getting the professional development they need in the way that we want them to receive it. So I look forward to furthering that conversation in the months ahead. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Next I have Dr. Anderson followed by Ms. Uh, Sizemore Heiser. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Solari, thank you so much for all of this work. Um, one of the things that you provide in the narrative was a glossary of terms, um, but I don't think it has all of the terms here. If we can put up slide five, I believe, the one that says reading instruction is controversial. Um, and looking at this, I remember at one time in schools, we couldn't even whisper the term dyslexia. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Dr. Solari, just just for the sake of making sure everyone understands what is it that we mean by these terms, can you give us a brief 
um, recap, a brief summary of each of these terms because you did such a great job earlier. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> well, I can't see all the terms, but um, on, on the slides in front of me, but I think, you know, basically what I've listed here are, um, you know, the important point is that reading instruction is controversial and I think unnecessarily so because we often have different meanings for these words. Um, and so the reading wars are essentially a 60 plus year, um, I feel like I have, I'm, 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 I'm like this is a test, a 60 year um, <laughs> battle over sort of this philosophical difference between how do you teach early reading? How do you teach reading development? How do you teach kids to decode words? One is the whole language, the other is sort of this explicit systematic instruction that we know um, is based in the science of reading. Uh, there are multiple dyslexia laws happening across the country in almost every single state. There are law, dyslexia laws that have passed um, to make sure that we're addressing the needs of children with dyslexia. Whole language is what I just described. It's one side of the reading wars. Balanced literacy has become the, sort of the new term for whole language, which I think is really very unfortunate um, because um, everybody loves balanced, right? And so like you say, oh, I'm doing li balanced literacy instruction, so kids are getting both sides of the equation, when in reality, that's not what they're getting. They're getting a different approach to teaching early word reading that's not based in science. And that's a really, really important point. Structured literacy is a systematic and explicit approach that was actually put out by the International Dyslexia Association. I tend not to use structured literacy not because I don't believe it's evidence-based, I know that it is, but I understand that structured literacy often is a red flag for people. Um, and so I want to, I'm really interested in buy-in. I want explicit and systematic instruction and reading. And if I don't want for me, I don't want to say one word and have people turn me off, turn off. Um, leveled readers are an approach to reading that's probably happened across Virginia. Um, basically that you match a kid with a level <laughs> Um, but the reality is, is that these levels are not empirically based, and so um, the levels often don't mean anything. And so, it, like saying that a kid is at a first, is at a G level or whatever, doesn't mean a whole lot, and also doesn't provide instructional guidance. Multisensory instruction is a way to teach reading that's based using different your your senses. It's often uh, aligned with the Orton Gillingham um, approach to reading. Guided reading is another thing when we talk about what are the things that um, maybe we need to let go of. Guided reading is likely one of those things, and I put it out there because it's very commonly used in classrooms, and it's related to the leveled readers, right? So you're guiding kids through these different levels of readers, um, but it's not telling you specific skill difficulties they're having, and so that's important. 3Qing and MSV are basically the same thing, and that is a core tenet of whole language instruction, basically that you're using different cues in order to understand words. This has been used across the country. It is currently used in the over, like more than 50% of classrooms for early reading instruction, and essentially it's using pictures to guess what a word says, or using just the first letter instead of sounding it out. And so it creates a situation where kids really don't know how to decode. They're just using different cues on the page. And synthetic and analytic phonics are just two different approaches to teaching phonics. And the literature base, um, uh, you know, there's different difference of opinions here. Um, but I think, you know, we sort of have fallen on the side of um, analytic phonics is important. Synthetic phonics has a place, um, but not necessarily it's explicit and systematic in its instruction. But Again, I could talk about all this for like three hours, so I will stop. No, that was actually very helpful. So thank you for setting that foundation. Um, one of the additional things that you talked about were the misconceptions about reading development, that every child learns to read differently. How would you provide some guidance for um, students who are native speakers, students who are um, who are not proficient in English and students who are older who are also not proficient in English and not native speakers, what would that reading instruction look like? Does it look any differently for each of these three groups? I think that's a really good question and actually it's a part of the research that I do. So um, 
I, but my, my work is really specific to Spanish-speaking English learners, and I'm really looking at, are due to the instructional portions that we use for English-speaking kids, do they also work in Spanish and also in English for kids who are learning English as their second language? And the, response, the answer is yes. Um, they really do. Systematic and explicit instruction um, and early word reading. Um, I'm actually writing a paper on this right now, summarizing all the um, data on this. Um, you know, if, if it's done in an explicit and systematic way, then you can get about 90% of our English learners reading at grade level, but it has to be done in an evidence-based way. Now, the older kids, it's a bit harder because when I, when I talked about earlier, I said, you know, it takes much, much longer to remediate kids or to help kids learn how to read when they're in fourth grade and beyond. Um, the instructional approaches are really similar, but I think we have to be, make sure that what we're providing kids is developmentally appropriate. Um, and I, there are researchers who do this work, and I'm really happy to recommend, um, you know, I've done a little bit in the older grades. My, my space is really in K, K to four to five. Um, but there, you know, University of Texas Austin, for example, has the Meadows Center, and they do a lot of work in the middle grades, the middle school grades and high school grades, looking at how can you prepare and provide professional development for um, English language art teachers and who, who are in middle school and high school and how can they sort of support the reading development of kids who are still having a difficult time learning how to read. Thank you so much for raising that. Dr. Presidio, I think this will sound familiar because as we had discussions regarding older students um, wanting to make sure that the materials were not only appropriate for them to develop those skills, but was also was not infantile in a manner that was not developmentally appropriate. So I, I thank you for raising that. Um, one of the things that, lots of conversations, I'm a former teacher, so I always go to the place where I wanna operationalize things and see what it looks like. Um, I believe the principal from Canterbury Woods. Can you describe just really quickly for all of us here, what does the reading block typically look like, let's say in, in a first grade class? Sure, um, and we start with a focus lesson. That focus lesson this year includes a explicit phonics or phonological awareness lesson um, in K through two, so sort of a 15 minute focus lesson for that. But the typical block in K through six is a focus lesson that is usually geared around a reading comprehension strategy. And when, um, when asked earlier, what are some of the things we can let go of, that focus on reading comprehension specifically isn't in the simple view of reading, that we will arrive at reading comprehension by focusing on language comprehension. So what we do in the language arts block is we have a focus lesson for a skill or strategy, usually around reading comprehension, and then we have a larger block that includes small group needs-based instruction. Right now, that small group needs-based instruction usually, or pro, I'll say pre-pandemic, looked very much like guided reading. During the pandemic, we actually had this opportunity to have small group needs-based instruction have um, a different quality and tenor because it was on uh, it was virtual and we could use assessments and kind of gear it even more with what the students were showing us they needed um, so the bulk of the time in the block is small group needs-based instruction while all other students are working on some independent tasks those independent tasks um, you know vary in terms of the quality of the task um, and the purpose of the task. And those tasks can be anything from uh, independent reading to um, working on words to um, applying skills that they've learned in those focus lessons. Um, and then finally, there is usually some kind of a wrap up, some kind of assessment, some kind of closing that would allow us to kind of cement their knowledge and have them focus on transfer. So that's sort of the structure of the block. There is usually a reading block and a writing block, or it can be a language arts block that includes alternating reading and writing skills. So that's, that's kind of like the meat. We have a lot of time that we can direct 
towards practices that are evidence-based and are really gonna make a huge difference in not just exposing students to skills, but ensuring that they learn them. Thank you so much. Uh, going back to Dr. Solari and what was just described, I definitely heard you um, sharing that the guided reading is one of the things to let go of because there's only so much that can be done in one day. What else would you recommend not to replace with a, with a, with a different practice? from what uh, was just described. Oh, from what was just described? Yes, ma'am. Or just in general. Um, or both. <laughs> I, you know, I think there is this uh, persistent practice in schools that we are um, relying on cueing to teach decoding. And this has been shown to be ha happening across the country. So this is not unique to Fairfax. Um, and it's just time to let those practices go. And I think when we're thinking or thinking about um, basal adoptions, there are particular curriculums that really do teach cueing. And I, th I think we need to be really careful to make sure that we are teaching decoding in an explicit and systematic way. Great, thank you. Um, I don't wanna lose too much time. One of the things that you talked about with the data in Virginia was that you noticed that it was not just socioeconomic status, but it was race that also impacted student performance. What does that mean? What does one do with that information? How does that impact instruction and focus? What recommendations could you offer, or at least some reflection? I don't want to put you on the spot. No, it's fine. Um, I think, you know, I, what it means is that we have an equity issue with literacy development in Virginia, and it's true across, it's, it's true across the country. This is also not unique to Virginia, but it might, you know, the discrepancies might be a bit bigger. And so um, we have, and this is persistent. This, I, I showed data from 2000 until now, and I could go back another 15 years, but I didn't because I didn't have enough room on the slide. So. Um, you know, I think we need to acknowledge that this is persistent, it's pervasive, um, and we need to make sure that when we think about kids entering schools, that we are providing equitable access and opportunities around reading instruction um, for our kids who we know are more likely to be scoring below, below benchmark. And I do think that this is a resource issue, right? It's also, a fo you can use this to focus your efforts. Um, all kids need high quality reading instruction, but we need to make sure that we are um, providing adequate instruction for kids who have historically not been taught to read in our schools adequately. One of the reasons why I asked that question is that we're talking about consistency, we're talking about expectations, and I think all of those are good things, but we definitely have deeper pockets in our um, division where we have some of the disparities that you just described show up a little bit more. And I just wanna get a sense of what does this mean in terms of our planning? Um, does it mean that we will have certain things in one place and not the other? I'm not quite there yet. If you could expound just a little bit. So I, I think our original is to get a really clear tier one instruction for all students, right? Not based on anything except for just everybody needs this. And then we need to start to differentiate. We need to think about what's needed for some of our special populations and what, and what we need to do. Um, Dr. Anderson, if you're talking about if there's gonna be different things at different schools, right now our approach is, as we look at this basal resource, is not choice. It's not things that schools choose based on what they think is best, but this is what we're all moving to um, so that we can have more fidelity. I'm not sure the if other, that answers your question. The other thing I would add is that, you know, we're still developing what a culturally responsive approach will look like to instruction, particularly, you know, for some of the subgroups that Dr. Solari mentioned and then some of the schools where we have high percentages of those students. And, um, you know, Dr. Williams and I have talked about that. We still need to build that out more, but we know that we have to have high expectations for students. Students have to feel safe, valued, and included in the school community. We need to know the assets that students bring in um, not just focus on deficits that some students might have. All of our students are bringing assets. We need to raise that up and acknowledge that and affirm that for our students. And we need to work on our beliefs and mindsets as adults 
um, and working with our students. So we've got to refine that cultural responsive uh, component of this plan, but that is a component that um, definitely needs to be included. Okay, I do have some follow-up questions, but my time has expired, yes. so mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sizemore-Heiser, followed by Ms. Pekarski. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your time, especially, um, and all of your time. I know it's, it's been a long day. I wanted to, um, this is such important work, and I really appreciate the information you provided initially to really frame how important it is and how important it is that we get it right with literacy in terms of the long-term impacts of high school graduation and so on. So I just wanted to say, say that, that you know, I'm very much bought into this work. What I am um, gonna put out there is I don't wanna have what I think has happened before sometimes in Fairfax County, which is we put a lot of thought into programs in place based on where our general education population is. And we don't ensure that that mentality, the culture, the buy-in, the training um, bleeds into across our different programming because we still have programming, I think, in silos in Fairfax County. And what I'm trying to get at is, you know, if we don't look at the people who are primarily educating our special populations and ensure that this training is systematically provided to them and the buy-in, I'm talking about our IEP teams and IEP case managers. And if we don't have alignment between our IEP goals and implementation and our literacy plan and, and it, all the way from the, the, the um, resources that you're purchasing, if we don't have that alignment, I, I don't know how this will work. So I guess that's my first question is what's the thought around that alignment? Well, I mean, I would just say that we, we recognize the need for that and, you know, with Dr. Boyd being new in her position um, and me being new in my position, that's one of the opportunities that we've discussed is how we can think about uh, better program alignment across general education and across special education. Um, you know, we've had collaboration in the past, but I wouldn't disagree with you. Um, you know, we still have had opportunity, or we have many opportunities still in front of us in, in too many past practices of being siloed. So uh, we are having a very substantive discussion about, you know, how we can think about curriculum development, um, really taking into consideration the needs of all of our special populations at the same time, not, de not developing curriculum for the general education population and adding on considerations for L's or considerations for students with disabilities or considerations for students in AAP, but designing that holistically at the same time. Um, so that is something that we're working on, but again, you know, to be honest with you, we, we have a lot of work to do there. I mean, that's something that's just beginning, but I do think the structure that we've set up with, um, you know, the work around the development of the Equitable Access to Literacy Plan with key leadership and involvement from, you know, all of the, all of the different departments, um, Dr. Boyd being involved in that, Mike Bloom being involved in that at the leadership level, um, is gonna help us accelerate that work. But you're 100% you're right. I mean, we're just at the initial discussion stages of what that needs to look like. I appreciate that. And I would just say that one of the questions I have is when we're implementing this at the school level, what does that accountability look like? And what does that buy-in and understanding and alignment at the school level look like? Because I feel like there's some going on, at the, at the, you know, there's a lot of collaboration at the leadership level, but at the school level, I feel like the silos are greater. And so what's the in, um, specific plan to address that issue at the school level? Well, that's where I think the Equitable Access to Literacy Plan can help us in terms of clarifying the direction that we're going as a, as a system with our literacy practices, the expectations for the practices that we want to see implemented, um, and to build into that, into that plan the internal accountability for us as system leaders. Um, I, do, I do think that in the past, teachers have received at oftentimes conflicting guidance from mm -hmm. one department and another department, um, and we can't have conflicting guidance. We can't even have multiple sets of guidance. We have to have one set of guidance, and, and I do think ultimately the, the Equitable Access to Literacy Plan, as it pertains to these practices, is an opportunity for us to figure out how to do a better job with that. I appreciate that. Um, the other question I had around um, around this is I appreciate that the folks on K through 12, I'm kind of curious why third grade wasn't included in that K through 12, because I seem to have heard a lot of issues that, you know, if you're not here by fourth grade. So I'm kind of curious why it, it was K through two versus not K through 12, K through two as this sort of this real focus plan versus K through three. So that was, um, you know, it was considered. Mm -hmm. And I think um, part of it is that pre-SOL, 
like that, that group of students who had sort of before the SOL period, and, and it was just really looking at what's the capacity, you know, designing these lessons and everything we need to do in this bridge year. It was, it was a heavy lift, right, from, from the PD to the curriculum development. Um, so I think the intent, and, and I'm looking at Donna, but she's only been here a few weeks, so she can't remember why we decided that either. But I know it's been a question, um, but it really, you know, our schools that are split are pre-K-2 um, and 3-6, and we really feel like, um, I think, getting to kids before that, that SOL time and really trying to focus. So. All right, I appreciate that. Um, the other concern that I have, and this may not be part of the literacy plan for K-2, through two, is that what are we doing to ensure that when we're putting in these new practices or, or you know, science of reading, that we're looking at our struggling readers four through 12 mm -hmm. and ensuring that they're getting this work too, as opposed to, oh, we're gonna start this for K through two and you guys are gonna figure it out. And in particular, how are we gonna look at our culture around four year graduation and students who are struggling with literacy in, in high school? I think this all becomes part of that larger plan, right? We're building some, we're building some foundational knowledge and skills with, with one part of our, of our teaching force right now, just those primary teachers. Um, we're trying to ensure, again, that we, we do have a fundamental belief that what happens in those K-2 years feeds that graduation, right? Like that's all a path. But we also know that there are students in grades three through 12. So part of it, the immediate, would be through some ESSER intervention. But the plan needs to be more comprehensive than that. This literally, this K2 this K focus or this pre-K2 focus right now is literally just for this year because we felt that was what we could do well. And if we tried to do pre-K6, I don't, I don't really know where we'd be right now because I don't mm -hmm. think, um, you know, I think our fidelity would decline um, and I think our supports would decline and it would not have been, um, it would not have been a practical way to, to start this work. I understand, that makes sense. Yeah. Two, two things, one, um, how much is the impact of pre-K access to the disparities we're seeing? And two, how much is the, folk, how much is the inclusion of the applied studies diploma in our on-time graduation rate leading to the um, graduation of students who may not be considered literate? Well, one of the interesting partnerships we have with UVA is a longitudinal pre-K study of the longitudinal impact of pre-K that's led by the dean at UVA. Um, Dr. Pianta, Pianta and um, we have very good data that tells us that when students come into us without pre-K experience, compared to students who come to us with pre-K experience, what their trajectory for success looks like yeah. in the school system. And we can look at students that come to us without that pre-K experience being, you know, you know, two standard deviations below the mean very easily when they start kindergarten on the first day. So that's just even more ground that we're asking mm -hmm. our teachers to try to make up and to try to cover in a really short period of time. So, I mean, this has been one of the board priorities for a number of years to expand um, access to early childhood education. And I think it does need to continue to be a, you know, a budgetary priority for us working with the county to try to figure out how to do that. And the applied studies diploma and the impact on literate Criticize my hijack. I just wanted to second okay. question. Yeah, finish, so. finish your second part. Yeah. No, that was I that asked the question. Before. I know you did. Yeah, thank yes. you. I think Dr. Boyd's gonna respond to that one. Yeah. Yes, just very briefly, and thank you for that question, Ms. Sazmar Heiser. We will certainly um, look at that overlay of students who are not reading on or above grade level and do an overlay with the plat those pursuing um, or receiving an applied studies diploma. Um, again, speaking from past experience in other localities, that's been a significant contributor. We know if you can't read, then you can't learn social studies content. You can't learn science content. You're going to struggle on your biology, um, SOL, all of those things that lead towards getting that standard diploma. Um, and so that, I think that's going to be really, really pivotal for a number of our students that would be able to move from that applied studies diploma to get a standard diploma and work with accommodations and things like that. So we'll work on that um, so that we can have that again as one data source that we can track. How is this impacting other things? as we know that the, the, the diploma type um, impacts some subsequent things as we look at post-secondary options and things like that. Thank you. Um, colleagues, before I, uh, Ms. Pekarski speaks, um, I just want to do a time check. Um, we did start a half an hour late, so um, I, I would like to go to 930 with the board's indulgence, if you, we, uh, but we will see. Right now, I just want to tell you, it took us one hour to get through five people. We have six more people who have not spoken yet. 
So, and if you're saying you have to leave at nine, then uh, Dr. Presidio. Well, no, I am. I am here at your pleasure, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I do want to be able to excuse Dr. Solari, who you know does okay. have a commitment in the morning and so, was anticipating no longer than nine. So, so then, then colleagues, um, for the remainder, colleagues who have not spoken, direct your must ask questions to Dr. Solari uh, at the beginning of your statement, and we will have, um, and we will have, of course, the staff here. Um, and we can do follow-up questions, but um, we, we will try to finish within the hour. Let's try to do that, um, and if we need it longer with staff, we, will, we can do that. But I just wanted everybody to be aware um, of everybody's time, and uh, get going, Ms. Bukarski. All right, I'm gonna try to be quick and try to get these answered at the same time. Thank you, Dr. Solari, for being so generous with your time. Um, I, I, I am just, extremely invested and excited in this work um, and in the fact that our uh, staff, I think we have the right team and I think we have the right board to really make some seismic changes um, to how we serve students. And um, it's personal for me because I do have an older student who did not um, have you know, the best literacy instruction. Um, she did not benefit from that. And I have a younger student now who is dyslexic, um, who's having a very different experience. And while that is my own little you know, uh, uh, world, um, I know that it mirrors the experiences of many, many kids, because I've heard that from many parents. So anyway, I had to say that, because um, I'm just extremely um, delighted we are doing this. Dr. Solari, is there a school division in Virginia or <laughs> across the nation who maybe is doing some things right, who is maybe a little bit more ahead in this work that we could look towards? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I get asked this daily. Um, so <laughs> um, sometimes more than once a day. So I think, you know, yeah, there are divisions that are, have been invested in this work a few years longer than Fairfax has, um, and you know, I, I'm, I, I hesitate to make recommendations only because I'm not sort of intimately involved. Um, but you know, things that sort of come to mind is Virginia Beach has been making some movement here. Um, yeah, I, I could, I could, I'll be honest, I can name many more districts outside of Virginia. <laughs> but probably not publicly. So I, I mean, I, I do hesitate a little bit to answer that question. Um, but there are models. I mean, one I think that's very well known is the Bethlehem School District in Pennsylvania. They have moved mountains. They have they do not have they have you know a, sort of a low income group of kids you know high poverty and they have fundamentally changed the way in which they're teaching reading and their data show it. Um, there's another couple of the districts out of Missouri um, that I'm happy to put you in contact with that I've been working with uh, or have contact with. Um, but yeah, I think that this, you know, th there are a bunch of districts across the country that are pushing on this right now. Thank you, that's helpful. And I mean, you know, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I think, you know, we've got an incredible team. But if there are other places where we don't have to reinvent the wheel, like let's, let's inform ourselves, let's get that information. And I think it's helpful um, to everyone. Uh, who is leading the professional development right now that we've done so far? Is that in-house or? House. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so, um, so far we have um, done professional development before school started with our elementary, with our pre-K two teachers. Um, and on the 11th, the teachers will engage in their second um, professional development, and that is led by the, um, the language arts team. And it's okay. been, I'm, I will tell you, I'm being honest, everyone is learning as we go, but it's been wonderful to, um, to bring Dr. McConnell in, who has some deep experience, because she's been um, a good um, person to kind of look at things and to bring, um, to bring some, some things to the table that maybe we wouldn't see. Um, Ms. Leesma, who's in the back, also has some depth of experience, so we've really been pulling on the people who have, who have experience and have knowledge in this area to, to lead this work. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything, um, uh, Dr. McConnell. No, I would just add that, you know, 
the elementary language arts team has with you know with collaborations across other departments has put together some really solid professional learning we started out the year with oral language development which we know is the, the foundation for for reading acquisition and then october 11th we're doing a session on phonological awareness which um, is one of the key indicators for reading success. So we're really leaning heavily on the science of reading and what we know about good evidence-based systematic explicit instruction. And we're doing that work with our pre-K two teachers. And I would also just add that um, we've got a whole host of other teachers attending. We have some of our you know, teachers who work with our multilingual learners. We have teachers who work with special education students. So it, it wasn't created and then, and then bolted on as an afterthought. We really developed this professional learning, particularly the October 11th session, with this idea in mind that we want to kind of center all of our students and that all of our teachers are touching these different students and we want that to be a part of the professional learning, not something that's you know added on. So we're excited about this. Thank you, and I know some schools have kind of started using some of these evidence-based, you know, instruction. So what does that look like right now across the, the district? I mean, how many schools are using these core lessons? Is that an expectation for everyone or, okay. Yeah, the expectation was that every pre-K-2 classroom would use the, the lessons that have been created, or some of them were already using evidence-based programs. Um, we gave them that flexibility, but everyone should be doing explicit uh, systematic phonics instruction this year, pre-K-2. Great. Dr. Solari, you know, I think one of the criticisms that I've heard, um, and, and I'll be honest, you blew my mind when you said, get rid of guided reading, that's like, oh my gosh, that is a big shift, but... Uh, <laughs> It is, I'll be honest. Um, the criticism that this, you know, instructional approach, um, it could it could be boring, it could be slow, it could um, really stifle kids' uh, love of reading. So, can you address that? Yeah, I also get asked this daily. So, I think you know, importantly. Um, <laughs> Effective early foundational instruction is not boring, it's not slow. In fact, we know from the data that doing this at a fast pace with multiple opportunities for kids to respond, they're working together at a build of groups, that is how you move this along. So it's not supposed to be boring or sort of like this rote memorization. Um, so that's the first point, I think. And I also think what's, uh, things that I think that we don't think about this is sort of flipping this on its head. So a kid who not, does not learn how to read in the K-2 space is a very frustrated kid. And I, I think recognizing that is really, really important. And those kids start to disengage. They are bored in school because they have disengaged. There's social emotional development things going on at the same time. And so um, I think it's really important to consider that, um, you know, this Systematic explicit instruction, number one, does not and should not be boring. It should be engaging kids. Um, but also, we owe it to every kid to give it to them because we need them to learn how to read so that they engage in all content areas. Thank you. And I'm going to try to finish before my time is up. Um, I know it's been asked, but I too am very excited about looking at this timeline of, of this plan um, and, and, and actually, uh, you know, getting to implement um, many of these things across the division and all our schools. So thank you for all your work. I, I am super excited about it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Tolan, followed by Ms. Cohen. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who's here this evening. I'm super excited to hear about this program. And um, having worked in ISD and trained thousands of teachers, you know, when I was reading the report and I saw that I, I guess we, we've trained 230 teachers maybe on this particular Orton and Gillingham um, program. We have a ways to go. And so I would just want to kind of say, even say to my colleagues, um, just listening to some of the questions, you know, how are we, we, what are we doing with the older kids? What are we doing with this? This is going to take a while. And we really, really have to be committed to see this through. Um, you know, I think we already mentioned it's not like an 18 month thing and then we're going to be, you know, pre K through 12. 
So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the plan and seeing that multi-year plan. And, you know, we just started our budget conversation, seeing the multi-year budget implications as well. I mean, you just asked for three resource teachers. That's nothing for 200 schools. So, um, and, and to really implement this. So just wanted to throw those comments out there that if we really want to do this with fidelity to, um, you know, we need that sort of multi-year look and what that professional development it will look like over those years as well and how it will change as more and more people do get trained and then can share that, you know, across the district and within their schools. Um, and so, and the central office staff as well, I really want to see in the plan too, like how those people are going to be trained to work together um, and across the um, departments. I know, you know, we do a pretty good job of that, but, um, you know, don't always follow through, I think, with really making sure that, you know, our science team is involved with the language arts team and the social studies team, just to make sure, you know, as um, Dr. Lips, look, Lipsig, excuse me, I didn't get the name right, was talking about, um, you know, how do we make our teachers more efficient and able to do this and do everything that they need to do across all these subject areas, um, uh, unless the central office is trained to, to train them too. Um, one quick question that I had is, how do you see this maybe evolving for those older students or for our secondary students? I would think as we get better and better at this, with the younger kids, it's going to look different for our older kids. Um, maybe some of these other districts have already seen some of that evolution. I'm just kind of curious um, what that might look like. I think if I'm understanding your question, if, if we do this work right and kids hit high school and they don't need to enroll in um, a literacy elective, so to speak, or an intervention, what are the doors that it opens, correct? What are the options? Um, you know, some might assume that it might open some doors to um, advanced academics work. You know, they may choose to take honors classes and IB classes and AP classes because they feel more confident in their literacy skills. Their reading and writing is stronger and they're more prepared. Um, it opens doors to electives that they wouldn't have had time in their schedule um, to take. Um, so it just, oh, I think it just opens doors. Yeah, it's super exciting, but I think also our staff needs to be prepared for that evolution too. They're, they will need to do different things as we get better and better at this. So it will be exciting to see how that works. But it, and I guess so that will be the evolution of the plan over time. And it's the, you know, it is the evolution and obviously we have to, we have to serve the students that we have now, right? So there's intervention that must take place, but the long haul, right, is when, when students Though some will still need intervention, that number is greatly decreased. Uh, I think the teachers will find joy in that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Cohen, followed by Ms. Mary. Thank you all so much. You know, I think, like Stella, I could feel myself clutching my chest when we said, done with guided reading groups, thinking of all the kids around my horseshoe table as we pulled groups. Um, but the truth is, is I think about all of those kids. I think about all the kids that it didn't work for, um, where we wound up trying Orton Gillingham, where we did every bit of phonics work that we could to try to bring them along. So um, I hear you. I'm excited about the opportunity to kind of rethink how we do this. I don't think systems get this opportunity very often. Um, but that said, um, you know, I think. Just the idea to me that, you know, PD is not just the what, it's the how. And I, I think we just keep adding on and adding on. And I agree, if we have got to take something away, we keep, this is a theme that I think we just continue to have these last weeks. And as the year goes on, we pile more and more on. So my ask would be um, to Dr. Brabrand and crew, as we start to have conversations about the calendar coming up, there's been a lot of conversation about how that second week of professional development planning time, getting your room ready um, that we had last year was life-changing for teachers. And I would really, really like us to take a look at giving teachers the two weeks 
and pushing the start of school back to the week before Labor Day, which we've heard a lot of folks who do not like the two full weeks before Labor Day, a lot of opportunities that kids miss out on because of that. So I would like to throw that out there um, as a thought. Um, the next that I was curious about is how are literacy resource teachers and ed specialists, how are they currently involved in this work right now? So if you, um, if you look back at the slide that talks about the, the sort of strategic plan um, or the project management plan that we're going to do, the idea is that we would have work teams um, set up and those would be, those would be um, the members of those would be from ISD, from DSS, from OSS, from Title I, and from school-based leaders. So we would be able to, we would be able to have them deeply involved in all the different parts. Now up to this point, they have been involved in different ways. They've been pulled in to do curriculum development this summer. They've been pulled in to um, work on the professional development. They've been pulled in sort of a less organized way. We also have reading uh, teachers and literacy leaders that are on our steering committee. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do with that group. We, um, we have literacy leader meetings coming up in um, October. So there's a lot of work to be done to kind of help everybody kind of come along with this plan. Um, so we know that's part of the, the work uh, to follow, but we definitely want to take that inclusive uh, approach, having those work teams built up by cross-departmental um, people and ensure that um, people have the opportunity to sort of understand where we're going and why we're going there, just as we're kind of doing tonight. Right, and, and before they are actively training on something. I just want to make sure that we're, when we talk about that we're bringing people along, that they're involved in the, in the beginning, not next steps. Um, my next question is, you know, we did see in the air interim report that MTSS is really used inconsistently across our county. What are our plans for um, changing that, improving it? So one of the opportunities I think that exists is with the ESSER funds, it's really very much connected to MTSS. Um, we've really been able to kind of think about that as a structure that's gonna help us identify students um, in need of intervention and build out the tools and the um, supports within that structure. So all of a sudden we've gone from people kind of choosing whether or not they are, are using MTSS in a really um, supportive way to a time where everyone's going to be using it as they build out their ESSER plans. So I think we're going to be seeing a um, much more fidelity and much more um, broad use of MTSS moving forward. Just, just a brief add on to that. I mean, for both uh, literacy and for math, we've set consistent decision rules um, across the grade levels for identifying students that might need additional support. Um, we've uh, identified the assessments, obviously, that, that schools need to give to be able to, to have the right data points uh, to identify students. And we've developed a list of uh, intervention supports that schools should be considering using with students that are identified uh, as being in need. And we're requiring, um, and I hate to say requiring because we're requiring schools to do so much, but we are requiring schools to use um, the data collection instruments that we have at the division level so that we can consistently look at the data um, from each of our schools about the students that are identified um, for additional services and the progress and growth that those students are making in every one of our schools. So um, a lot more fidelity to MTSS practices this year. Could I, I just really briefly wanted to add on that you can't talk about MTSS without recognizing that core is the heart of it. and the challenges that schools are having with MTSS is everybody's in the emergency room. So as soon as we start actually giving kids what they need on a daily basis, MTSS can be what MTSS is supposed to be. So yes, those decision rules are gonna help, but knowing that kids are getting that information in core, we're gonna have a whole lot less customers in the ER. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate very much that we've mentioned kids who are using assistive technology tonight, and I wanted to ask about our SLPs and ATS reps part of the work team. So 
So those work teams are being in development to be formed, and OSCI is going to be a participant in that. And so we'll ensure that we have diverse representation because we know those persons bring unique skill sets and perspectives to the table that may not otherwise be present um, from some other uh, stakeholders. Yeah, and I just think it's, you know, it's an area where we really have not, our literacy programs have left those kids behind. Um, the last thing I just want to ask about is working with BDOE and also adapting our planning and pacing guides. You know, teachers, as soon as they hear this, want to know the how and the why and can see, you know, how things are going to have to change structurally as well. So can you give us any insight into that? So that is, that is definitely the work to come, um, and we are trying really hard. Um, you know, we didn't really want to pile on an extra 15 minutes this year, but we, we knew we weren't ready just to start making major changes on such a short timeline. So I think the first step is building some foundational knowledge and then really providing that clarity of what that instructional block looks like, and then aligning the basal resources and the new, you know, the, what the planning, how the planning and pacing guide will sort of evolve as we move forward with this work. Thank you. My hair flip got counted as my time. So yes, thank <laughs> I just want to say I really appreciate yeah. it. And um, I have a million more questions. I know this is the beginning, um, but I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Marin, followed by Ms. Amesh. Thank you. Um, Dr. Solari, I was wondering if you could talk about when it comes to identifying struggling readers, what, you know, I've heard stories of teachers, of course, well-meaning teachers saying to parents, no, I know your student's is just a slow reader, just wait, it's fine, and then the, the student is identified as dyslexic or some other disability. What would uh, professional development look like to train educators to identify reading delays and possible disabilities? Gen ed teachers, thank you. In service teachers, or it doesn't matter, I guess, pre service or in service. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the way that we've approached this in a, in a pre service phase at UVA is making sure that our, our teacher candidates understand what the science of reading is, number one, as foundational knowledge, um, and that they understand how to implement evidence based assessment and instructional practices and what are the early indicators of risk. Um, there, we do have developmental science around the early indicators of reading risk. And so when you're implementing a screener um, for kids in the pre-K to two and beyond space, you wanna make sure that you are assessing those particular subcomponent skills. Um, and so the way we, we make sure that we are training our teachers to understand the subcomponent skills that make up the broader decoding and oral language, so the stuff underneath the two broader skills needed for reading comprehension, how you assess them, um, what risk looks like in those subcomponent skills, and how you teach those skills. That's probably more than what you wanted, but yeah. No, I'm just wondering because I see two approaches. It's getting all of our teachers ready to teach a child who is part of that majority who can be ready to read and the others who struggle, and just that's like a two-track thing yeah. for me. I don't think it is, because I think core good reading instruction is good reading instruction, right? And that's true for all kids in the classroom. And so part of this is that you do do an early screener, and so particular kids are going to score. There's heterogeneity in the kids, right? So they're all going to score differently. And there are some flags for risk. And then you provide evidence-based instruction aligned with the science of reading, um, and you see which kids respond. And if you're doing that adequately in the core, you'll be able to see which kids, if kids who have persistent risk, then those kids need, need more dosage. That's an interesting way to, to talk about it as risk. I mean, I think of some examples I know of where I, I also, well, scratch that. I also wonder if the culture of teachers identifying potential challenges or disabilities needs to shift. Because what I've experienced, even just as a parent, is sometimes teachers don't want to be the one to say to the parent, you know, there might be a challenge. So that's something, too, I think, that's going to have to be embedded in the PD. I think that's I, I think that's right. And just I would also say really importantly, a culture around this is everybody's thing to deal with. I mean that's like a really easy way to say it, but like this is a gen ed teacher's responsibility. It's a reading specialist responsibility. It's a special education teacher's responsibility. We all are invested in making sure that every child learns how to read. 
Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is, um, Dr. Solari, given that you've worked so much within the state, um, you know, what state legislative or departmental changes might need to happen to further help us do this work and, of course, benefit all the students in Virginia? You know, are there requirements to be adjusted? Are there funding and programmatic supports that we need to put into place? We are developing our legislative agenda in a few weeks, so if, again, if we're really going for this, let's go at all, all angles, so I'd love to hear what you think. I mean, I think there's multiple places to push on in the ed code. Um, I unfortunately spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, there, you know, there's very little guidance on what evidence-based core instruction is in reading in Virginia. I know there's hesitancy from the VDOE side to mandate anything, of course, um, but providing some guidance around, like, what are the curricula that are um, evidence-based is an important first step. I think working a bit on the ERI language um, to tighten that up, I know that was done last year, but there's also some more places to push there. Um, there is some places to push in the ed code on higher education. Um, so, I mean, I think that there's multiple places that you would want to look at. Yeah, can you speak to that? Oh, I just would ask you if you could speak to more about the higher education component, because that is not our primary focus, but obviously if we're getting teachers who are licensed in Virginia and we need to essentially remediate our teachers, yep. that's a big drain on our resources. Yeah, so the, there's a difference between ed code and regs, right? And so the regs are pretty clear about what um, early, what we need to be training our teachers in related to early reading instruction, elementary credentials. The ed code doesn't have much at all, so that's one place. And the other thing that I think is really important is there's this assessment that our teachers take to be credentialed called, called the RVE, uh, which I think everyone's aware of, but that's not aligned with the science of reading. And so the way in which you get higher ed to move on this, and this is sort of my, what I do, is, you know, it, you know, I hate, I don't like the term teaching to the test, but almost you kind of have to force the issue a bit. Like, if you want to reform the way in which teachers are being trained um, to teach early reading, then they have to be expected to have the knowledge that would be on this assessment, and so the assessment would need to be reformed. Dr. Just very briefly, I was going to say, I, I think that's a really interesting question, and, and, you know, I wonder if there might not be some advocacy to the state that they lead on this issue, and Dr. Solari mentioned, I think, some specific things they, they could lead with, but, you know, I came here from Oregon 10 years ago, and in Oregon we had, um, at least at that time, invested in regional kind of training and support sessions, or, or regional training and support service divisions that could actually work with school divisions to do this work. Um, and I know that, you know, now the, the literacy, um, the National Literacy um, Institute has moved to Boston University, but thinking about some of those types of opportunities for the state to invest in, with, with financial resources and consulting services and support services for divisions, I think would be really helpful, particularly for smaller divisions that don't have the same resources. I, just really briefly, I want to mention that I am a part of INSOL, so National Center for Instance, and with my colleagues at Boston University, so we are pushing on that. Great, and I just wanted to lastly just point out all the different intersections that we've raised tonight. There's the budget, the calendar, planning time, professional development, instruction. So what, I mean, if that's gonna be a big nexus, I mean, it, it's a huge thing, but it's so exciting because I am thinking about what happens if we go through a generation of students. We get that 12-year plan and we phase this, you know, um, inability to achieve out. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you to staff and our experts. Um, it's been a late night, so I appreciate you staying focused with us here and presenting everything. Um, obviously, this is really exciting work. I, in anticipating uh, what's coming, especially since it's such a core piece of that equity uh, work across the board, uh, Dr. Solari, I'm curious whether you can point us to some of the maybe social tropes of what to anticipate. We are a school board after all. When it comes to buy-in, Obviously, there's a component of getting staff on board, but then the community as a whole and the response and whatnot. So if you can help us, even in working through some of our own implicit biases, just pointing to some of what we can expect, uh, hopefully, so that we can weather rather than, um, you know, have block us. I think not underestimating um, sort of those deep-seated philosophical beliefs about how early reading should be taught is really, really important. And this is, again, not the fault of our teachers. They were, they in, by and large, had been trained this way in their teacher credentialing programs. 
and they, they have access to instructional materials that sort of feed that philosophy. So not underestimating that and sort of pushback there is really very important. Um, and then also I think, I think couching this and framing this as a social justice issue is really also very important. So this is an equity issue, but it's a, literacy is a social justice issue. And making sure that that, you know, that messaging I think is really important that you, we are sort of thinking about all different learners, um, the assets that they bring to the table, meeting them where they are, um, expect high expectations. So all the things that we sort of want our teachers to be doing, um, but you know, for for individuals to sort of su to succeed in our society, being literate is really very important. And so I think messaging around that, um, and um, and no, no, not you don't want to shame anybody, right? And I think that's really important for our teachers and administrators. Um, this is not a shame game. This is an awareness. Like, hey, we've we've been doing this perhaps in a way that's not evidence based and it's not equitable for all of our all of our students. And so we're going to change. We we're going to change practice because we know to do better now. Yeah. Have you observed maybe school boards that have been successful at this, or um, you know, institutions and what they've done to ensure that they are able to message it that way? Yeah, I think community messaging is extremely important. Buy-in early from your uh, stakeholders is important. What I will say is where I have seen change happen um, in a positive way, it has been a very collaborative ex collaborative situation between the school board and central administration. It has to be. Um, and so there has to be buy-in on both sides or else, it, you know, nothing's going to change because you have to push on multiple levels simultaneously. Um, so just having this meeting, you know, not every division is doing this. And so sort of coming to the table and having these hard conversations I think is an amazing first step, but there does have to be collaboration between the two entities. Yeah, I appreciate you being explicit about that, you know. Um well, I think this is a great step to celebrate. You know, as colleagues, we should also be mindful of when uh, ugly may rear its head, to anticipate it and just be mindful of that. It's a full expectation that that's going to happen, and we continue to push forward. Um, I also just looking at the data. I, I thought that um, you know, reflecting on slide twenty nine, state versus uh, Fairfax County, looking at some of the data in the report seems a little bit inconsistent in terms of trends of what we've seen statewide and then for Fairfax specifically, um, especially when it came to income and the influence that that had or how significant English learner uh, deficits were in Fairfax. I'm curious as to whether you, maybe you gave some thought or could do an analysis on how you read that, you know, for our division. Well, it's a different measure, so I think that's important. I'll, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect measure, and so iReady is actually tapping into different sub-skills than PALS is. Also, PALS is under revision and needs, it needs to be revised, and it's going to be. It's currently being revised. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think you would have to do a really direct compare. It's, it's hard to say without having the data and really looking at it and analyzing it. Um, but it, it is a different measure. Like there are certain divisions that are using not in, not in, um, not where am I in Virginia? <laughs> um, there are certain districts and others in other states that use iReady and also the STAR early benchmark, and they get completely different results because it's two different measures. And so it's really hard to look across measures and sort of make a judgment on that. Yeah, and and you directed me exactly to my next point, actually, which is. You know, we're relying heavily on iReady and SOLs. I know that we're moving as a division, as a state, uh, towards different metrics of assessing success. Uh, what are we thinking? I mean, staff, Dr. Solari, in terms of how that will influence. I mean, we could be completely off the mark if we're relying on, you know, certain metrics that we don't believe are accurate reflections. Well, I, that that is a, a great question, <laughs> and I don't even know that we have enough time to go into detail on it. One thing I would say is just focusing on the early grade levels in particular. Um, we went through a really extensive process to select iReady as the assessment that we were going to use because we thought that it gave us the most comprehensive information that we could use to identify students that would present with risk. 
mm -hmm. right? And that we could use then to follow up with a whole series of diagnostic assessments to go behind that if a student is identified as exhibiting risk. So we don't rely on just one measure. The iReady data that you're looking here is really kind of our screening measure and our progress monitoring measure because we give it multiple times over the course of a year. Now that being said, we're very excited to hear about the work that Dr. Solari is doing with revamping PALS, um, and we think that there might be an opportunity for us to even get um, better information from that new revamped assessment. Um, but when we, select I, when we selected iReady, that's why that we selected that particular instrument. The nugget is, it's one instrument supported by multiple assessment measures behind it when students are identified as being at risk. Yeah, I think we're gonna definitely wanna consider that as we develop a plan to see how we're gonna assess the needs to give ourselves different lenses into the problem, right? Um, to see the full picture. So I appreciate that consideration. Um, I also just wanted to make sure we reflected as we looked at the report specifically. I was a little bit surprised, um, page 13, seeing at grade 11, the SOL rates, I think it's just so glaring when you look at English learners and, and the disparity. But then also that the percentages even pages 14, 15, go down as you increase in the year of success rates. So K has higher pass rates than second grade, right? And then 11 is even worse. So I, I, I just wanna point that out again further for thinking around the plan that we develop because it really is kind of glaring. What are we doing as a division uh, if that's the case? It, it's know? another great point. Again, brief answers on that. I would say a couple things to note. One, um, one thing I just always point out because I think it's important to understand that when our students in Fairfax develop English proficiency, right, they are performing above the division average. So we know the students are very capable of achieving at the highest levels in the school system, but they need time to develop that English language proficiency. Now that being said, as Dr. Solari has mentioned, if we're giving them the right tier one instruction from the beginning, we can accelerate that achievement cycle, right? And reduce the amount of time that it takes for them to perform at that level, which is something that we need to continue to work on. The other thing when you're looking at those, uh, those data charts, um, when we see, and Dr. Solari pointed this out in her, I, I believe in her earlier data, that when students don't perform well in the early grades and we have them in this cycle of intervention, it just takes that much longer for those students to actually be able to get to level. Um, so we need to address those gaps as early as possible. And then one other thing to point out when you're looking at the data, um, the benchmarks change from grade level to grade level. So it's not, I mean, it makes it more difficult when you go to the subsequent grade level, the bar or the standard that you have to meet is even that much higher. So that's just another, uh, just another thing to note in the data. It's my time. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you, thank you all. I, I don't know if I have any questions left, but I guess there were just some crucial questions here. And I think I just wanna wrap up by saying I think what do we need to let go of, right? We, we need to define that. What do, where and how do we find time for proper professional development? These are big, big questions. Um, some people talked about we were, were only doing this since last spring. I have to say, if someone who's been on this board for 10 years, um, we started this with a strategic plan and we didn't reach our goals um, for a myriad of reasons, lack of funding, uh, you know, different approaches. So I think it's it's crucial that we understand literacy has always been at the heart of what we do, but I am excited that we realizing there are new approaches, new ways, and new ways to meet our goal. Uh, Dr. Presidio, I really appreciate it, what you said, you have to affirm assets, not just deficits. And I say that though with disappointment in my heart as I look at page 13 and see that my, my region has some of the lowest levels of, of, of scores on the iReady test. So that, uh, that is frustrating to me, so, but um, I am excited. I, I think requiring um, a plan um, that is not a choice will be a, a cultural shift for us here, a big cultural shift. So Dr. Solari, you said, um, if we don't understand uh, the anger and frustration that may come about, I think, we, we have a little bit of understanding, but we're we're going to. So so I guess my one question to you then would be how to best overcome that. Like what what is your what what have you seen that works to to kind of bring everybody together? I actually think I've had this conversation with Noel and the team. Um, 
<sighs> you know, I think data speaks is, is very loud. Like, so data is important, right? And so, um, part of, you know, one approach you that some districts take is they start small. They start with a coalition of the willing. So you have principals that want to do this, and then what happens is data starts to change at that school. You know, reading performance gets better in the early grades, and other principals say, um, well, what's happening at that school, and how can I do that? So that's one way to think about it. I mean, um, and there are, there are examples of successes um, in that way. You know, the, the, the sheer size of Fairfax makes that really hard. <laughs> <laughs> because you can't start with one school because we'll, we'll be here, you know, 50 years from now. And so, um, you know, I think setting up a culture of success for all kids, making, making teachers and administrators very aware of the discrepancies in the data and the urgency with which you need to address that. It's, I think the first step here is really the awareness campaign and to get buy-in. Um, from administrators and also teachers. And you're gonna, you need to give teachers some time to understand that they play a really, they know they play a really vital role in this. Um, but you know, some of the practices are going to have to change so that we can address the discrepancies and, um, and that can be difficult for um, a pill for teachers to swallow. What I have seen though is, you know, I think it is important to, t to, <laughs> to talk to other divisions that are doing this work. You can learn from them, and even if they're just starting the work, um, there are ways to sort of talk about um, how to be strategic around this, and there are divisions around you that are talking about this. Um, so, you know, sort of sharing that sort of burden of the how, how do we do this sort of at a mass scale, I think is important. Yeah, that's very important. Um, thank you, and, and I hope you will be end up being one of our partners in that to help us along. And I guess my last comment will be, um, and some of my colleagues have, have, have alluded to this too, though, um, while we want to be deliberate and get a lot of community buy-in on this plan, I think some of this comprehensive plan has to be available in tandem while we do our budget work from this year so we can invest heavily this year at the beginning. I mean, of course, it'll be a long-term investment strategy, but I think um, I, I appreciate, Ms. Klimiko, everything that you've said about, you know, the need to do it methodically and slowly and get all the buy-in, um, but if we kind of do it strategically at least year one, and as, as Dr. Solari said, start small, then we can do that part of the plan and, and work toward that. So. Uh, that's all my time. I will give back 15 seconds to the board. Um, Ms. Omesh will ask the next uh, section of questions. I guess if you want to just go down the list of where we had in, if you have a um, second round of questions, we will do one minute. And um, Dr. Solari, we understand if you need to leave before that, but um, if you can stay, um, it will be one minute for each board member. And it depends on how many want to do it. So if you want yeah, to do it, raise your, your placard or raise your hand. But we have the list. We'll just go back on the list that we started. Okay. Can you raise your hand if you want to go back? Oh. Okay, so that's that's one. Doc, Dr. Dr. Saloria, based on that, has now signed a contract <laughs> with Fairfax County Public Schools and the school board. Congratulations. Okay, so I think only two of us. Well, I'll go back, so we'll do a minute and a half. We can start with Mr. Frisch. Thank you, and I hate to belabor the point, um, but I want us to think a little bit bigger, and I'm curious what the alternatives would be to building-driven building professional development for implementing such a huge plan like this. What are the alternatives to building-driven where we can have a better handle on fidelity of implementation? Well, I mean, I and think perhaps Dr. Solari can tell us about um, other methods she's seen as well. Well, we definitely would love to hear from Dr. Solari. I'm going to let Noel weigh in in just a second. Um, I think, like anything, it's it's a combination of methods. I, I think the scale, though, it, it's really important for all of us to understand when we're talking about thousands and thousands <laughs> of teachers how difficult that is to do direct training. There's some things we can do asynchronously, and and that's good. You can get kind of information that way. But when we're talking about practice, you actually need iterative cycles of support and training. 
you, you can't front load everything and say, okay, now go into your classroom and apply this theory in practice. There's gonna be implementation challenges. You're gonna need coaching and support. You need to see somebody model these practices. We know a lot about best practices for professional de development around instructional strategies, and it takes time, it takes follow-up, it takes feedback, it takes coaching, it takes support. Um, and, and that's where the challenge, I think, is real for us with our scale. But um, definitely we're looking at every, every available option. I certainly would welcome others to weigh in. I think everything you just said is very true. I think the other thing that um, is important here is you actually do want to build building level capacity here and to sustain practice over time. And so that's an important piece that I don't want to ignore. You want to build folks in each building who have the knowledge who can help. Um, and we all know, you know, the data has really shown that sort of these one shot PDs is not effective to change practice. We know that's very, very true for changing practices around reading. It takes time and it takes coaching um, and it takes feedback. Um, I think understanding that for a lot of teachers, we are asking them to fundamentally change their practice. And that takes time. How do we make sure that admin are trained as well so that we have complete buy-in at the building level if that's where most of this is going to take place? And what kind of transparency safeguards can we put in place to make sure that we're on top of it when we have schools that are resisting this evolution? Yeah, that's another great question. I mean, one of the things that we've been doing and, and plan to continue to do is training with principals, administrators, and the literacy leaders, the coaches at the same time, so that they're working together to get the same information, to support each other in understanding the work, and to develop an implementation and turnaround plan in their schools. Um, so that's critically important. And then, of course, continuing to work with our region teams to make sure that they understand the work at a deep level. Um, they know when they go and do classroom observations and school visits what to look for. Um, and that they're able to provide um, that additional support and coaching uh, to the principals and the leaders in the building, of course, in collaboration with central office specialists. But again, I think it's gonna take a systems approach to, to do this well. Can you speak to the question about transparency as well? Can you, can you maybe help me understand that question yeah, a little bit better? I, you know, I, um, the board only gets to hear about what we hear about, right? And so, if we are having difficulties at the building level, how will the board be made aware of that? You know, I think that's something that we can continue to talk about uh, with board leadership. Um, you know, one opportunity to do that, of course, is in board meeting, uh, board members meetings with the regional leadership. Um, that's one opportunity to do that. Um, also reporting in, in terms of the accountability plan that we have for the system, there's perhaps some ways that we can include some of that there as well. We need to do a so little like more the idea of the regional reporting and maybe having some kind of systemic version of that like we have had during the pandemic. I think that might be very helpful. Um, I will say also, there are lots of building level leaders who are excited by this, right? Um, I've talked to many principals at the elementary school level who have already been investing school resources to train staff and begin moving in this direction. So. Uh, I don't want to paint a picture like we have uh, everybody at the school level who are going to be resistant. I just want us to be practical about what the roadblocks are, because that's going to be our biggest hindrance. And finally, I'll just say thank you, Dr. Solari, for being here tonight. I hope this is the not, not the last time that we uh, get to talk with you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Um, very quickly, this is for Noel. And in my eight years, roughly, as an FCPS parent, I have never seen a basil come home in any subject whatsoever. What can parents expect regarding this basil that we are thinking about adopting? Is Just give us a little bit of detail, if possible. So because we're in the process of a, a request for proposal, the procurement process is underway, I can't really share the types of things um, or the, the actual things that we're looking at. I don't think that this would be your old school textbook and that everybody's gonna start on page one and we're gonna all move through it and all do the same things. That's not gonna serve all of our students well. Um, our basal resource adoption changed from a textbook adoption when we really wanted to look at a variety of resources that teachers could use to support. I don't know, Dr. McConnell, you're, you're, what you can say or if you prefer not to say anything since you're under oath. 
<laughs> well, every time I hear basil resource, I have a flashback to the hardcover one inch six pound book that I got, you know, I covered with like grocery sacks when I was in elementary school. I'd just like to assure the board and teachers listening that that is not the direction that we're moving. Okay, thank you. And um, many of my questions were answered, but I did get a couple from parents who are watching this and there seems to be concern regarding two things. And if you could shed some light, that would be helpful. One, the opportunity for differentiation would be lost because it was shared that this is, there's one option here. And um, two, that students will not have access to rich and meaningful texts. Can someone speak to that, please? Yeah, I, I'll speak to the second one first. You know, importantly, when you're doing high quality oral language and vocabulary development, you are engaging children with high quality text, complicated, more complex text. That's what you're using a lot of the time when you're doing that. So um, there's, I would suggest, although I'm not writing the plan, that there would be nothing in the plan that would um, stop teachers from spending time engaging in high quality literature with children. And um, I for already forgot the first one, sorry. Right, and so differentiation, it, you know, there, this is actually, evidence-based reading instruction is differentiation. Um, you are assessing kids, you are using that data to drive your instruction. So you are differentiating your instruction based on where your kid, the kids are in their literacy development. So that is sort of the definition of one of the parts of scientifically based reading instruction is differentiating your instruction. Thank you. Uh, one of the concerns that I've always had myself uh, as a former teacher and school principal is regarding the writing program. Now, in what uh, the principal from Canterbury Woods sh shared earlier, she talked about how the written um, piece is part of the literacy block. Can we speak to what the expectations would be regarding writing and the teaching of writing um, during this transition, or not transition, this new approach? So I can say a little bit, and then uh, Dr. Leipzig, if you want to add in what's happening. But you know, when we, we talk about reading, we've talked a lot about reading tonight, which is wonderful, but we actually, this plan is about literacy. So you start to talk about reading, writing, speaking, and thinking, right? The, all aspects of it. So we would expect um, for us to be able to think about our reading program that we're going to be doing and how what's the complementary writing program. So this would be an inclusive of both reading and writing. And just to add on, we, we know from research that kids need explicit instruction in writing and in spelling. And often our approaches to writing are um, not explicit enough that our students may not have the spelling skills to use the words they wanna use and to communicate the depth of thought and, and experience that they want to because they're limited by their encoding skills. So spelling is a big part of the foundations of writing. And the wonderful thing is if we're doing phonics, phonological awareness and phonemic awareness right, we can give them multiple opportunities to expand in both encoding and decoding. We're two sides of the same coin. And we can then really help kids embrace composition as a means to explore their deep understandings of the oral language. And it's a, a written form of the language skills they're developing and the vocabulary development they have because we've given them lots of meaningful, um, higher level thinking skills, lessons, critical and creative opportunities to engage with ideas. We just need them to have the tools to express those ideas in writing as well. Um, the last thing is just talking about spelling. We've gone from spelling, which were the, you know, list of words. You get 10 every week to word study. What does it look like under this approach? So, you know, just to kind of build on what we just said, you know, spelling is the flip side of decoding. Encoding and decoding are connected. So 
we know that recognition precedes production. So we have to be able to recognize that each word is made up of certain sounds. That recognition is gonna proceed, we can then capture those speech sounds as we write. And so the ability to say a word slowly into its component syllables and its component sounds is very much a part of writing instruction and spelling instruction, but it's also gonna support early reading behaviors. So they're really so in inextricably linked that we should not be looking at a separate spelling curriculum, which is often word by word and somewhat um, random in terms of what words we want kids to commit to automaticity. We do need to recognize that fluency in reading and fluency in writing are inextricably linked. And if we give students a lot of opportunities to both decode and encode, and make sure that our phonics instruction, our phonological awareness instruction, has both a written and a reading exp um, experience with it. That's how we're gonna make sure that students transfer their skills to fluent and automatic reading and writing. That's my right. time, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Next is Ms. Cohen. Thank you. Um, just a couple of other points. I'm I'm really glad to see that ACSC um, is on your list to have a seat at the table. I just want to emphasize again that adapted curriculum, um, assistive technology parents, they have to be able to see their kids in this. And um, we have got to make a special point of it. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to say, um, Dr. Leipzig, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from your staff. Um, you know, we would love to be able to see this in action because um, to the point that a lot of folks were asking about how do we communicate this to families, I think people need to see it in action and see what is fundamentally different than the way that we've been doing it. Um, and we really do have some education. We keep talking about professional development all night, but we have got to do a really good job of educating our families um, about what this is really about. Because if we don't, then not only are we putting a lot more on teachers, then they're getting it from the other side, um, which is pushback from families. Because you know the folks that this works for, our current approach, it, it works for. And so I think that we have to make sure that we have people understanding this is something meant to work for everybody. Um, and it won't diminish your child's experience as well. So um, that's all my preaching on PD, but Dr. Leipzig, we want to hear more from you and please, please reach out to us, um, all of our schools and anybody who's working with this to let us know the success stories, but also any concerns that you have that we can be helpful with. Thanks. Thank you. I think when we look at professional development of teachers, we have to remember that we're all midstream and we're midstream at the individual teacher level, we're midstream at the school level. And so truly powerful professional development experiences need to acknowledge where our teachers and our schools are starting, because that is not at ground zero. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, I just have a final point. On Dr. Solari, hopefully this can be your uh, mic drop and, and go home. Um, no, but I just wanted to add one more thing to incorporate into our plan. I think in trying to have some intellectual humility around this, and I'd value your perspective, we don't know what we don't know. Obviously, we have the scores that we're looking at, mindful of the fact that they're not reflective of everything, as we said. Um, you pointed to some community factors earlier, right? There's so many dimensions to how we end up with these outcomes. I'm, I'm wondering if it would be beneficial to have something like a focus group or something, just to identify some of those barriers as to why families are not able to access that kind of learning, besides instruction. I think that's the piece where we're looking at research, but I, I value your input onto the merits of something like that, um, as I, I view it as incredibly valuable. I mean, maybe we'll end up knowing, you know, parents' language access or uh, income, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, you know, the inability of parents to provide supplemental learning or tutoring or whatever it might be, but I'd value your feedback and then we can call it a night. Yeah, I, I think that's incredibly useful uh, to, to sort of reach out to parents. I mean, in my experience working with parents around early literacy practices is that often, um, especially our parents that maybe do not speak English as their first language or don't feel a connection to the schools, they actually don't know um, 
what they can ask for. And that sounds a little odd, but like that there are barriers there. Um, and also there, you know, in my experience doing some focus groups with parents is there is a deep trust for, there's in some communities, there is a trust for what's going on in the classroom. And that they are the, you know, teachers are the professionals and they're teaching our kids to read. And so um, I think digging into that a little bit and sort of how do you have a very honest conversation about um, what is happening in schools and where they sort of see the holes. Um, I think some of our communities are hesitant to ask and to inquire because you know edu the education system is very big and broad and complex. Thank you so much. I hope Ms. Clemenko, Dr. Presidio, we can take those factors into account, some of those intangible pieces that uh, nonetheless impact the outcomes. Thank you all so much, everyone. Have a good night. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>